So here's the deal. The last time I did this, we had some disagreements. Uh, there may have been some things that uh, we disagreed on. You may have not liked some of the things that I said. There were some mixed, there's some mixed uh, feelings on it. Some of you disagreed, some of you agreed. Uh, some of you had some choice words for what I had to say. <laughs> but uh, let's do another one. Let's do another Civ, Civ Leader tier list. And uh, you'll be actually surprised to see some of my rankings change. Um, some things stayed the same. Uh, some leaders dropped a few spots. Some went up a few spots. I think another whole year of experience playing Civ uh, every day kind of changes things for, for at least for my perspective. So um, another thing here too is I did not show this in the last tier list, uh, but this is the, the spreadsheet. This is the back end of the spreadsheet. Uh, for for the tier list, um, how you, how it is weighted. This is based off of Peppermint Butler, uh, his tier list rankings that he did last time. It's the same weighting. Uh, there's a couple weighting factors. Um, there's the early game strength, late game strength, versatility, dependency, synergy, and strength of focus. Uh, early game strength is how powerful the Civ's abilities are in the early game. How can they snowball? Uh, late game is obviously late game, like when they're fully online and everything is, is uh, chugging along, like how well does that scale? Um, versatility is you know how are they can they do all the all the victory conditions um or are they only geared towards one condition only uh dependencies how dependent they are on external forces so like if they require specific resources if they require to have a religion stuff like that synergy how well do all of their abilities work together um and then the last one how their strength of focus how strong is that sieve at their presumed focus so obviously you know uh um gandhi's presumed focus is like religion right or or uh sweden's presumed focus is culture things like that um and then uh, down here is the tier description. So S tier starts at 96.9%. Uh, A is at 89.9, B 79.9, C, D, and F, so on and so forth. So so yeah, uh, that's uh, the explanation of the weighting and how the ranking works. Uh, but before we jump into this video, uh, I do want to say, if you uh, have not checked me out on Twitch, uh, come hang out on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash Bostheus. I stream every Monday through Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific time, uh, where that is where all of my edited gameplays come from, is from my Twitch stream, and I edit them to YouTube. Um, that's Once again, that's at twitch.tv slash Bostheus every Monday through Friday, uh, where Fridays I am now streaming whatever I want. Monday through Thursday is Civ, then Friday is if you want to watch me play Skyrim, if you want to watch me play dota um city skylines whatever it is you guys want to watch me play uh, also one more thing before we jump into it Th this is a little disclaimer this is an opinion piece you can disagree with it that's completely fine uh some it's a lot of the civs are up to personal preference right um but this is coming from the perspective of a deity player i only play on deity that's how i judge the civs i'm not judging it based on multiplayer obviously some civilizations are going to be way better in multiplayer for example mongolia mongolia in vanilla uh, without running BBG or any CPL mods, Mongolia is one of the best civs in the entire game on vanilla. So uh, I understand that this is only deity. This is single player deity. This is not multiplayer. If you don't play on deity, if you if you play on you know something like Below Immortal, that's some of these maybe way you may be going. Why the hell is this person an F tier or S tier? Like X, Y, and Z is so much better. So just wanted to get that out of the way before we jump right into the rankings. So. Last time I went from A to Z in regards to the leaders, and uh, and I think this time I'm actually just gonna go from the the F tier to the S tier because I think that's just I think that's better. That keeps the S tier for last, the A and the S tier for last, so you get to see uh, how I how I rank from bottom to top. Um, plus, I mean, if you wanted to skip to the end, to skip to the end. It, it, I have timestamps. There's also chapters down below if you wanted to skip. It's not gonna hurt my feelings. This is a long video. I understand it. Uh, and then another thing here too is that uh, I think it I mean it, it, I feel like it doesn't need to be said but I'm gonna say it because I think this is a, a thing that gets lost a lot of the times and people don't realize yes every single sieve in the game can do anything that they want to technically like every single sieve can do religion every single sieve can do dom science whatever you know um, that doesn't mean that they're the best at it or good at it but I just want to get that out of the way because I get that a lot being like well I play Gandhi domination and I do very well. Like, okay, yes, obviously in the perfect situation, every single Civ can be S tier, uh, but that's not what we're arguing about here. So I just want to get that out of the way because I know people are going to bring that up and, and they've said that last time. Uh, but if you want to do that, you can, um, but we're going to start from the beginning here and the worst ranked once again is our boy Gilgamesh. Uh, this was pretty controversial last time and I think it, if you if you don't play on deity or if uh, I don't know I just think that his abilities aren't great <laughs> his abilities just are not great his the, he received a buff in the latest patch where he gains 
an extra combat strength bonus when you are fighting against a common enemy. But if you're playing on deity and you are utilizing him like you should be, which is a really early war with war carts, people are not going to like you. Um, you, you the people are just, yeah, they're just not going to like you. They're, like, it doesn't matter if you have those early warmonger penalties. After that, they're still going to dislike you because you're going to be declaring war on people. And if you're trying to do, if you're playing Gilgamesh to his strengths, you're not going to have an ally in order to gain alliance points and to get the extra combat strength. I've always talked about this in multiple times in my streams. I don't want to play as Gilgamesh. I want Gilgamesh as my ally, which is funny because if you did not know, you can befriend Gilgamesh turn one when you meet him without sending delegations or anything like that. So uh, that I'd much rather have him as my ally instead of uh, instead of playing as him. Um, Ziggurats, uh, if you haven't seen my comet video that I played with Gilgamesh, uh, I talk about Ziggurats in depth. Ziggurats, I think, are one of the worst tile improvements in the game. Um, they do provide tourism equal to its cultural output uh, later on in the game. However, the problem with Ziggurats is that they take up useful tiles. Um, now, you're probably thinking, well, you could just spam them on a river. Like, yeah, that's that's nice. On a, on a floodplains river, that was probably the best. That is his bias, starting bias, too. It's probably the best place to place them. But um, I would, in a lot of the places, I find more often than not that I want to place a Ziggurat, I'd rather place a district there, or I'd rather place a farm there to get a farm triangle. If I would say if ziggurats provide housing or at least half a housing, then they would be. This would just he would he would literally just not be F tier because of it. So uh, ziggurats are are pretty pretty awful. Yeah, you get a little extra culture and science and stuff like that. But I'd rather have my settler out faster and immediately. I'd rather have my second settler faster than gaining the extra culture and science. So um, uh, additionally, I I just I really think that everything else about him. Is, is just like, there, there's so many different things that when, I think when I judge a Civ and a leader, if you make their, their leader bonus or their leader uh, ability completely useless, like if it's useless and you can't use it, that just makes the civilization bad. Like if you literally just can't use their leader bonus, um, and that includes the extra combat strength and alliance points, like if you just can't use that in the game, it's going to make them bad. All of his stuff does just not synergize well together too. That's another big thing uh, I talked about previously in how I weight my tier lists. And if if he just doesn't like he just doesn't synergize. Like you want to go domination, but you can't go domination because war carts come online too early and they're too expensive to build, so you can't really take over a civ and deity. It's just and then you you can't really you don't really want to go science because there's nothing really that gives you science. Additionally, his civ ability for capturing a barb outpost, granting tribal village rewards, like Barbarian outposts are only going to be there for so long throughout the game. Uh, and the fact that there's a possibility that you can't even use your civ ability past the medieval era is just, it's just one of those things where it just makes Gilgamesh bad. He is objectively bad, and that is why he is still down here in F tier, just like last time. Coming up right behind Gilgamesh, we have, uh, we have over here, uh, the Congo. Uh, where is he? Uh, we have over here, here he is. The Congo, I have him in D tier. Um, once again, poor Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is by himself in F tier, uh, but that's okay. Uh, the, the Congo over here in D tier. I think I actually think the Congo, um, it's, it's hard to say. Like the, the reason why the Congo for me are so low, they do have some really good abilities. Like they have some really good abilities with, uh, with their relics and the way that you can play culture with them. Um, I think their culture game is really strong. Um, uh, I, I do think that they have some like abilities of making really really strong case for really good culture games with in regards to like their great artist points and, and great uh, um, great musician points and things along those lines as well as gaining insane yields from their from like you know their museums and stuff like that. For me, the reason why I dislike the Congo so much um, in regards to why I have them ranked so down so far. And I understand that this is like a gimmick of the game, and I understand it's a gimmick of what to do, but they're the only Civ in the game where you cannot play one victory condition of the game, and I think that just completely, for me, is just, I think it's silly. I've always criticized this as something silly. I understand that the Congo were like, it was a thing that you wanted to make them very unique and stuff like that, but the fact that you can't, you literally can't win a victory condition in the game. I know some people might think that's like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, you have to win other ways, but I think just taking, just completely removing out a victory condition kind of takes away from 
not necessarily the di I mean I don't know if the difficulty of the game if that's if that's right but just kind of just takes away like the flavor of the game and and I think it's just a little I don't know a little I think it's just silly um on top of that he his his unique district is a is a neighborhood and when when do I build neighborhoods I only build neighborhoods in one instance and that's to go biosphere tourism I only build neighborhoods for biosphere tourism i never build them for their intended purposes even in culture games when you can build uh shopping malls to gain more tourism i never build them because it's a waste of a tile um there obviously aren't especially specialty districts so they don't take like a district slot in regards to population but they take a district slot on the map and they take up a tile on the map and if i'm playing culture games i'd rather take away that neighborhood and put in a national park or put in a an imp tile improvement that gives me extra tourism as um, once you, you know, hit flight and stuff like that. So the fact that their district is just completely useless and garbage and the AI loves to, even though it was nerfed, it was nerfed, but they still love to do it. They love to run recruit partisans on your neighborhoods. So that's just still another reason why I don't build them anyways. It's just, it just makes, once again, the Congo down into D tier. If, for example, you could do religious stuff, you could build holy sites and win a rel you know, and do religion with him, then he would probably be in C tier, maybe even low B tier. Um, but the two of those together, whoops, two of those together just makes the Congo uh, uh, pretty, pretty garbage for me. Um, after we have the Congo, uh, we have, I'm, I'm putting in, oh, that's, that's, that's Harold. Probably scared some people. Uh, Harold, can you move please? So I can, I can bring up our next person of Nubia. We have a Manator of Nubia. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I tried really hard after after the last ranking to enjoy uh, a Manator to enjoy the enjoy Nubia and I do enjoy, I do like their leanest leader bonus of getting the increased production uh, next to city centers as well as Nubian pyramids, um, but I think the the nerf on their production towards range units uh, as well as their their starting positions I think generally they are still pretty not great uh, overall. Um, uh, Pitati archers uh, are pretty good. Um, they get a higher combat strength than regular archers, uh, and they also have, uh, district, they have increased strength on district defenses, but I think the fact that Nubian pyramids are so, um, I don't know if the word is, like, hard to, because it's not super hard to build them con considering their bias, considering that Nubia has a desert bias, uh, but, uh, there's a lot of, there's a, there are a lot of tiles that I don't necessarily want to build Nubian pyramids on, um, so so it is kind of hard to district and play their little district mini game with with Nubian pyramids around them. So uh, taking that into all taking all that into consideration, I still think Nubia is, is still in the D tier. Um, there are some other civs that that do what she does and but 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 better. Uh, I think Egypt and Matias's district building mechanics are a little bit better than hers. Um, they don't require as much. Uh, well, I mean, with her, obviously, you get the extra 20%, right? Like, you, you just get that, um, you get that right off of the bat with, uh, being, being just 20% production towards districts, but the 40%, if there's a Nubian pyramid adjacent to the city center, I think is, is one that is hard to, hard to get all the time, so. Uh, Nubia, down in D tier, I mean, I just don't think that they're that great, so they're, they're just down there, and I don't, I, I've still tried to reconcile it, and I don't think they can, uh, go any higher than that. Oh, next, Yad Viga, the king of Poland, also in D tier. Even with her buffs, she still just—I don't know. I, I still think Yad Viga is is not that great of a civilization. Um, for her, the way that I view Yad Viga is—I I hate. I think one of the biggest things that you'll find in this game, and not to say that everything has to be like perfectly streamlined and stuff like that, but one of the things, one of the biggest pet peeves that I have in this game is when they take a leader and they give them multiple focuses that doesn't necessarily uh, gear them towards winning the game. And in this one, Yadviga's ability of um, gaining culture and gold and, and yields from relics and holy sites giving extra adjacency means you want to do some simming stuff, means you want to do some culture stuff with religion. Uh, and the, in the culture bomb, taking a territory with the culture bomb converts it to Poland's religion is really nice for, for religious games, but the only times you're ever going to get that is with the, um, maybe, of maybe doing some preserve stuff, uh, maybe getting it through World Congress, or you can use her civ ability, which if you build a fort or a, uh, an encampment, you claim the surrounding tiles. But when are you building encampments in culture games? 
You know, this is one of those things where they just don't synergize. Like, why would you build... If you're playing on Deity and you're trying to win in, like, less than 200 turns, you're trying to win, win as fast as possible, when are you building encampments? You're not building encampments except for maybe to Culture Bomb. Um, uh, it's just it's just one of those things that are just don't really work out together. Um, the, the relics are really nice. I, I will say I did do a Relic Tourism game fairly recently, and that was an insanely fast game. Um, so I, I think the fact that that was really fast does bump her up a little bit uh, higher in the D tier um, with that. And, you know, actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this up a little bit. And I think I'm going to put, uh, you know, what we're going to do on the fly change. I'm going to put Yadviga in C tier. Maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh based off of the culture game. Uh, but everything else isn't that great, like science and dot, like doing all that stuff. Aren't there? I don't think makes her super strong. I mean, Winged Hussars did get buffed in the last uh, last patch. Um, they obviously aren't the Winged Hussars of Civilization V, but they are still very, very good. So, uh, with that being said, I'm actually, yeah, I'm just going to bump her up to C tier. I had her in low D tier, um, but I think harking back to what I had done in my t Relics Only Tourism game, um, I think that bumps her up a little bit. So, we'll, we'll, we'll put her into C tier. Wow, an actual change on the fly. I think this is the first time I've done that in my tier lists. <laughs> Okay, so the next one is, this is just another one of those ones that I, I just don't, I don't know why, I really do not know why they did this. Uh, she's also in D, D tier. We have Ellie, Eleanor of Aquitaine, but the English version. Some, like, I, I understand them splitting the, like, some of, some of the civs into multiple personalities, you know, like, uh, Teddy is probably the best example of that, Rough Rider and, and Bull Moose. Um, the one that actually kind of works, but with Ellie, I just, this is one of those sieves with one of the, like one of those sieves that they, they, it just didn't make sense to make her, I mean, I understand like by historical perspectives, like, like the French and English versions, but what they should have done instead of splitting black, black or sp splitting Catherine of France into two, like they did in the new frontier pass and then Ellie into two, they should have just kept Eleanor of France with all of her abilities and then uh and then then or maybe like changed one ability from regular France that way that synergizes well I, like they should just pick one or the other them splitting makes Eleanor of England one of the worst civs in the game in that respect because uh there, there's just no synergy in what she wants to do um Synergy is a big thing for me. Synergy, like, in, the, in how their kit works together, is just, it's just one of those things It's super weird. Like, yeah, you get all the great work loyalty issues with, with Eleanor. So if you have a lot of great works in her cities, you know, they cause the loyalty issues of cities around her to lose pressure. Um, but then you have the, the abilities of, like, you, you want to go Navy Dom. And it's, it's just so strange. Like, you want to go Navy Dom, you have a Royal Navy Dockyard that, that, that that incentivizes you to to go domination with her and gain extra production towards industrial zones and things like that but then you also want to build archaeological museums like it just doesn't make sense it's one of those sieves that just they i i don't they, i think they dropped the ball on this one and her kit just does not make sense you want to do one or the other um i know that there was someone in my last comments were saying like uh, that were that was criticizing me in the way that I was thinking and being like you just kill everybody and win the game anyways And it's like no, I mean if you want to do that Yeah, you want to do that But if I want to win as fast as possible in the way that the Civ is intended to be played Some of them just don't make sense and Eleanor is one of them I would much rather play Eleanor of France and Eleanor of England uh, and if I wanted to play um, England I would just play Victoria of England because she does what Ellie does but better so uh, Eleanor of England D tier All right with Ellie out of the way uh, we have another D tier Civ here, um, and that is that is Chandra Gupta uh, of India. He is also in D tier. Um, I think I do. I will say that I think Chandra Gupta's abilities are nice. Um, I do like his. I do like Varu. I think Varu are one of the strongest units in the game. Uh, so I will say that about about uh, about Chad about uh, Chad Gupta over here, Chandra Gupta. Um, step walls are okay. Uh, I I think. I think the fact that they do provide plus one housing, like one full housing, not even a half a housing, but a full housing is, is really nice. Um, the extra faith and food uh, is nice too, but it's, it has to be placed next to a farm. And it's, it, I think one of those things that it comes to, or one of those things with these 
unique improvements uh, is in regards to that, that I, what am I trying to say? I think the step well is one of those improvements that are, are good. They're not like incredibly amazing and they're also not awful. They're just like right in the middle of the pack, uh, a decent tile improvement. Um, and I think Varu, like I said, Varu are one of the, one of the best, um, one of the best units in the game. They ignore zone of control. They're uh, they're a, a heavy cav. Um, they replace uh, they replace horsemen, and they don't require horses, which is the best part. They don't require uh, strategic resources. So, um, but the other thing with with Chandra Gupta is unfortunately, it's just the, it just the follows with, along the same path of like Ellie, and uh, and that it just it doesn't make sense for like Chandra Gupta. You just want to go to war, um, and his civ abilities just don't really matter unless a civ took. Uh, like you know, stupas for amenities and um, crusade, which the AI never does. Uh, the religion aspect of it just doesn't really matter. Um, if you're trying to, if you're if you're trying to go to war with with India on deity, you need to choose one or the other. You need to go to war. You need to get a religion, and you can't really do both unless you're Byzantium, uh, and especially since you don't gain the great extra great profit points. Uh, so there's just kind of no point and even going religion with him. So uh, the religious aspect of it isn't going to help your domination aspects. Um, nothing really synergizes well, except for maybe forward settling the AI with two cities, unless the AI, it, it is kind of defensive. I will give I will give Chandra Gupta that, where it's, if the AI forward settles you, you get your war of territorial expansion really fast, like really, really fast, um, which is, I think it's in military training? instead of uh instead of what's it called uh mobilization but still that's that's pretty far away uh that's pretty far away for an early game uh casas belly i mean it's a lot sooner than mobilization but still um even then chandra gupta d tier uh if there was something that gave him more benefits to being closer to someone like uh maybe um he gained I, I don't know. Maybe there wasn't any religious aspects at all, and he just gained extra, like maybe increased production to Varu or or something that just helped him out a little bit more than just religious stuff. He would be a little bit better. But D tier is where I have the Chad. And with that, we're on our last D tier Civ, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, I I thought I had more, but I guess <laughs> I guess not. Uh, but with that being said, um, I have like I said our last one here, and that is. Uh, that is Magnificence Catherine. Sorry, I had to find her. Uh, we can actually just spread this out now. Uh, Magnificence Catherine, I think, is the worst of the two Catherines in the game. Um, I think that uh, that Magnificence Catherine is... I don't know. I think I think other Catherine is great, um, but Magnificence Catherine is just one of those... I don't know. Black Black Queen Catherine is, is way better for some reason. Like, for, for, for multiple reasons. Um, the... Uh, the the project the tourism project is just I don't know I just don't I don't care I do not care about it um, I do not care about it I would much rather have the I would much rather just use the spies get the spies super early on um, and gain the diplomatic visibility than get the extra culture from improved luxury resources like adjacent to a theater square square or a chateau um, having to utilize like theater squares be adjacent to luxury resources is just real i mean i understand like i think it's a cool idea in concept but in practice especially if you're not playing with bbs is just it's it's like the maya with their plantations it is just does not it does not it does not work out as well as you think it would be so uh magnificence catherine uh easily the worst of the two catherines uh and she is down here in c tier with the rest or sorry d tier with the rest of these d tier uh d tier sieves so magnificence catherine down here so jumping out of d tier i mean we kind of did already with with uh uh yadviga being bumped up a little bit um but the the one of the next ones that i have in d tier here um in the next lowest one is uh our our boy uh, Mansa Musa, where is he? There he is. Uh, I should have organized it a little bit better, but uh, CT here, bottom of the pack of CT here, uh, Mansa Musa. He has some very incredible late game, late game strength. He's one of those sieves that if you can get him going, if you allow him to do what he wants to do, um, and he has like the perfect setup, he's going to be one of the strongest sieves in the entire game. The caveat with him, and this is something that is, you'll notice. Uh, a trend here between C and an S tier, anything basically below S and A tier, you're going to notice that they require a lot of dependencies on things around them. And Mansa Musa is one of those ones. Um, he gets bonuses from being in the desert, which is really good. Settling on desert tiles. It's very similar to Peter. Um, he also gets a half price commercial hub. 
uh, and his commercial hubs gain adjacency bonuses with um, with holy sites. The biggest issue with Mansa Musa is his early game, and that's I think especially if you're playing on Deity, early game is very very important. It's how you snowball. It's how you win sub 200 games, games below 250 turns. And the fact that your mines receive negative one production, and if you're spawning in desert, you're only gonna have desert flat desert tiles, uh, desert floodplains, or desert or desert mines. And the fact that you can't even get extra production on mines in the desert just means you have just really crappy tiles. You have really crappy tiles. It's like sure you get the extra food from city centers, but you have really crappy tiles in the early game. You're super far behind. Like maybe you get lucky and you have extra with the extra faith you can get religious settlements and get that settler out really fast. But the fact that you have to wait to get a to get a religion so like it takes you such a long time to build your holy site and to get to your unique infrastructure just puts him all the way down here in in the bottom of C tier. Um, it's it's just one of those things where he has the potential of being very amazing, but you have to grind and you have to like grab you have to like hold and grab Monsa Musa kicking and screaming to get to to get to the end game in order to to win. So if you're if you have a nearby neighbor. You, and you're basically just dead uh if you can't get past the classical era to medieval era and you're super far behind it's really hard to win with him but if you can and you're able to snowball and do what you want to do with Mansa Musa and you can just live by yourself in the desert then you're gonna I mean it just you're just gonna be like Mansa Musa you're gonna be like the richest person in the world so Mansa Musa low low C tier the lowest of the C tiers let me move him over to uh past Yad Viga uh lowest of the C tiers right here uh that is where I have him all right next tier uh which is one of the one of the ones that is bumping up a tier this time uh surprisingly which i think people were a little mad at me last time it's understandable i didn't play her a lot and i thought she i mean she's kind of a meme uh but this year uh our lady tamar is jumping up into c tier um tamar's not as bad as i made her out to be last time tamar's not as bad as people think she is she's still not great <laughs> she's still not great but she's not that bad um I, I think the uh, the early game, I think the, one of the main reasons, I mean, she did get buffed, right? She got changed a little bit, a little bit, taking some inspiration from BBG uh, and how she plays. Um, uh, the only the, the issue that I have with, uh, with Tamar is that they kind of changed, well, there's two issues. They kind of changed her to be, you only really want to play her in dramatic ages. Uh, if you don't play her in in dramatic ages, then it just it just feels weird Like it feels like she was meant to be played in dramatic ages only because you know, she has the civ ability that uh that the um, The dedications of golden heroic like also grant normal ages or normal age bonuses uh, in like towards improving era score um and then when you play in dramatic ages, uh, you when you are in a golden age you can use an additional wild wild card slot and you can also use dark age Paul you can use any like gold, both golden age and, and dark age policy cards so it feels like you want to play her in, in dramatic ages only which is weird I think I think making sieves have a special ability like making like one or two sieves you know for example Gilgamesh has that as well in in the with heroes and legends mode but making like sieves only have an ability in that's like obviously clearly better than their regular abilities in a special game mode i think is a little silly i think you need to get, kind of do it with everyone or do it with no one and having one or two of them just is like it's just very strange um uh the one thing that i think is really cool um and can be used very well early on is uh their leader bonus which is where you gain faith based off of killing a unit that can be super strong if you have a lot of barbarians around getting like if you have like a barbarian scout you kill the scout and then you kill the, you know the spearman in the camp that's a lot of faith really early on and allows you to get your pantheon pretty fast. Um, additionally, you also gain, uh, if, if you spread your religion to a, if you get a religion and you spread it to a city state that has envoys, um, sorry, if you spread your envoys to a city state that has your religion, you gain two envoys. So it's basically like using, uh, using that Diplo card, which I can't think of off the top of my head. I use it all the time. So, um, she's good. Kevsers are good. I think Kevsers are a decent unit. Um, they only require uh, 10 iron. Uh, so I think I think they replace the man at arms. I think they're really good with their combat or uh, the extra combat strength when fighting in hills. It's also one of those things where, um, I mean, they gain a little extra combat strength. I think it's 48 instead of 45. Uh, but, you know, if you fight them on flatland, you don't get the extra combat strength. But when they're on hills, they are incredible. Um, and they're unique. Uh, 
their unique renaissance wall um which comes a lot faster than regular run walls is really strong too uh but i think once again they're in c tier they're in like the middle of the middle low pack of c tier because of how how their abilities can deviate they can be either useless or really really good so uh tamar i think she's good i don't think she's amazing but i think she's way better than people think she is and way better than i used to think she was so c tier for tamar after tomorrow, we have, a, I think it's going to be a pretty controversial controversial one, and I know that people were not very happy with me last time, and it's still going to keep it the same. Uh, Christina of Sweden, um, she is going into C tier. Uh, she's low, low C tier, middle of the pack C tier. Uh, I still think she is not... I mean, I think she has the capabilities of doing really strong things. Like, the, I think the auto-theming um, of Great Works and Wonders, like, I think the auto-theming is really strong. Um... I think the, uh, the, what is it called? What, I, what is her unique? Uh, I think it's the, the building. It's uh, It replaces the Government Plaza building, the Queen's Bibliotheque. That's what it's called. There we go. The Queen's Bibliotheque is really nice. Um, you know, you get the extra great rider points. That is a little bit later. I mean, actually, it's, it's, your, it's your tier two government, so it's not super late in when you want to get those bonuses. Um, so I think those are pretty nice. Uh, the extra great engineer points are okay. If you get, if you're building factory, like it's one of those things where once again, I like, I really dislike when they do this, like it, it can open themselves up to being really cool. But when you're playing culture games, which is what Christina wants to do, you want to build her culture. Like you want to go culture games with her. You don't want to like you, you, maybe you'll build one or two like campuses and, and, uh, IZs in industrial zones for, you know, maybe to get some great engineer points so you can get a, a great engineer out um, but it's just, it's one of those things where I, I you want to go like, you want to build like holy sites and theater squares and commercial hubs so you can get the trade routes to trade with people. And if you're playing on deity and you're trying to win a game really fast in most cities, you're only going to have three districts, maybe four at max before the game ends. Um, maybe, maybe your capital will have four to five districts and your second city will have four and you can get one in there. And so that means that you're going to have one of your satellite cities building a, a, a university or sorry, a, um, a campus, or you're going to have a satellite city building a, an IZ. So the extra great engineer points and, and uh, scientist points, they're like cute, but they don't really matter in the long run. Um, so it's just, I don't know. It's one of those things. Unique unit, the Corellian. It's good. It's not bad, but uh, once again, Sweden, if you can get her, if you can get her theming bonuses to work, which you should be able to, it's really strong, but I still think there are better civs that get, there are civs that are way better at culture than her, uh, and she only can do culture, her other, I mean, any civ can do anything that they want in this game, but based off of her presumed strength of focus, she only wants to do culture, and there's only, not everything synergizes very well with her, so C tier, uh, which is, I mean, it's still not bad. C tier isn't terrible, but uh, I don't think she is as good as people th uh, say she is. Next, next here we have, where is he? We have Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi is also in C tier. Um, I, I, I like him better than Chandra Gupta. Um, I, at least with Gandhi, you like, it's really obvious what you want to do with him, right? You want to go religion. There's like no ifs, ands, or buts. You want to get a religion. You want to be peaceful. You want to spread your religion to everywhere. You want to use all of the follower beliefs that you get from his uh, his uh, civ bonus to, to help out your religion. Um, but it is one of those things. The reason why he's lower on the list compared to other religious civs is you don't necessarily... Like, if you're playing a religious game, religion is one of the fastest victory conditions you can get on deity. You can get it sub-150 really, really easily. And by the time you're winning that, people aren't going to be spreading their religion to your cities that much. You're not going to be wanting them to do that. You you mostly, like, sure, you're going to have your, like, say, for example, your holy city, your capital, most likely, is pop 10. You're going to have, like, nine followers and one of yours and, like, one of, like, your nearest neighbor. But the majority of the time, your satellite cities are going to be the ones that are going to be containing maybe the majority of your religion and then two, like, one population of uh, like a religion nearby um, but other than that you're not going to be gaining a lot of the bonuses from other follower beliefs and it's it's one of those ones where if you're playing uh if you're playing religion uh you're trying to get you're basically following like two things you're or basically you're doing you're doing one thing right you're trying to get to theology as fast as possible and you're trying to build like mahabodhi temple and that's really about it that's like all you really need to do and then once you get to theocracy 
um, and uh, you you gain that government. You buy all of your apostles. You send your apostle. You send like four to five little control groups of apostles out, and you spread your religion. And you win the game at like turn one forty five, right? Um, so you don't care about his ability of gaining the follower beliefs. Um, the amenities are nice. I don't. It's it's just one of those things where in religious games, which is what he is geared for, and that's like his entire kit is for religion. It's it just doesn't. Some of those things don't really matter that much. So, um, getting religion with him is is nice. Um, it it's not like you don't get extra. That is another caveat: is most religious civs gain extra great people. Um, he doesn't, but he does gain extra faith per turn if you meet a civilization that uh, that has a religion and isn't at war. Which on deity, the majority of the times that AI are getting religions really fast, so you can gain you know an extra twenty five. Uh, 20 to 25 faith per turn in the classical era, which is really nice. It's really hard to get that much in that early on. So that is a nice little bonus I will give him. Uh, but I think I think C tier is good for Gandhi. He's uh, right in the middle of the pack of C tier. Um, nothing. He's not an incredible sieve. He's not an awful sieve. So I think that's that's where I'll place Gandhi right there. Here we have, here we have another controversial, another controversial take. Uh, and people were real upset at me about this one, I, and I'm still keeping him. He is Teddy, Rough Rider Teddy, in C tier. Teddy, Rough Rider Teddy is still legitimately the worst of the two Americas in this game. Uh, he does have, like, strength when it comes to Diplo stuff. Uh, you do gain, you can get a lot of envoys by trading with city-states. Now, if you play with secret societies and you run Isles of Minerva, Isles of Minerva, like, synergizes with him insanely well, right? Trading with him, gaining... Uh, uh, getting a ton of envoys to city-states, being able to seize every single city-state is crazy. Um, you also get the extra, like the extra combat strength is like okay, it's not, it, it's whatever for fighting on your own home territory. So I don't really care about that. Um, but getting the all the diplomatic policy slots converted to wild card and the extra diplo favor per turn for each wild card slot, which is what you want to do, is play him diplo is really is really nice. You can play a pretty good diplo game with Teddy. I will give him, I will give you guys that that you guys were criticizing for me, and that's fair. You can play a pretty good diplo game with him, but it's just one of those things. Once again, diplo and synergy uh, and the rest of his kit are is just not like I don't I don't care about the Mustangs. The film studios don't matter for for Diplo victories. They give you tourism. If you're playing Diplo victory, you care about Statue of Liberty. You care about um, I forgot the other wonder that gives you. It's the religious wonder that gives you uh, the extra um, Diplo points. You care about getting to the end of the tech tree to get the extra Diplo point there, and you care about the World Congress. And, like, you don't care about anything else. You don't care about going to war. You don't care about building units. And so when you only have, like, one and a half abilities that's going to help you with Diplo victory, it kind of makes you a one-trick pony and, and pretty low on the low on the game. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Bull Moose, Teddy – sorry, uh, Rough Rider Teddy – I have him down here in C tier, uh, a little bit better than, than some of these down there because of because of uh, some of the abilities that he gets, but kind of a one-trick pony, and uh, yeah, that's where I have him. After Teddy here, uh, we are moving in to, wait, did I grab the right one? Uh, oh, I almost grabbed the, I almost, I almost got the wrong one. Uh, we're going into Mongolia here, but we are going with yeah, I, I, we're going with Kublai Khan. I'm getting frustrated at myself. I should have like organized this. I have it still organized from A to Z on my Photoshop, which is what I'm using to rank this instead of uh, like the tier list maker. <laughs> uh, so it's all unorganized here. But Kublai Khan Mongolia, um, he's all right. Like I think the Kublai Khan editions were kind of a weird one. Um, I think I'm really. I thought it was cool that they were adding Kublai Khan to the game, uh, but I thought that them making them split between China and Mongolia, like. I understand the reasonings, like like the historical reasonings behind them, but it just it makes one of those things where both they're so similar in sieves in the game that it's just I don't know. It's very it's weird. It's weird. Um, the the early leader bonus though, the extra economic policy slot is really cool. That allows you to run like God King and uh, and urban planning in the beginning of the game, which is pretty strong. Extra production, one extra production in the game is really awesome. Um, However, the one thing that I, I think is really weird with them is that since you're playing Mongolia, you want to go domination. And uh, I guess, well, okay, I mean, I guess it does kind of synergize. You get the extra diplomatic visibility through the uh, the trading posts with that civilization immediately. Um, but I still think it just kind of uh, pigeonholes uh, Mongolia. I think the other um, Kublai Khan is better. Uh, I think the, it kind of allows them to do a, a couple more things a little bit better, um, allows them to 
uh, it'll, uh, it, you get the bonuses that you get from them are way way better than just getting the diplo visibility. Um, diplo visibility is nice as Mongolia because you want that combat strength, but that's really like the only thing that you have going for <laughs> going for you. Um, I mean, I guess the the later bonus is nice too, but th I mean, there really isn't too much to say about Kublai Khan. C tier, middle of the pack sieve. I think a lot of people are interpreting this area as like anything lower than A tier is just like absolute dog shit. Um, and it's not like C tier, that's still a good, these are still like good sieves. And I think also like I mentioned it in the beginning of the video, um, but I think there's a, something to be said about like every single sieve can do anything in the game if you want them to. Um, but we're talking about in ranking sieves based off of like what they are intended to do and how well you can play them based off of their intended to do. and and. If you take that into consideration, yeah, I think this is uh, this is pretty accurate. So Kublai Khan, Mongolia, C tier, right in the middle of the pack. Oh, where are you, Harold, my boy? Harold, our C uh, C rating, coastal rating, uh, mustache man. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying with that. Jesus Christ, uh, Harold. Harold's another C tier sieve. Um, He's good. I mean, like for what he wants to do, he it's pretty pretty straightforward, right? Build boats fast, build unique boat real fast, real early, settle on the coast and kill coastal cities. Um, the problem with Harold is that he is very reliant on being a coastal sieve. If you were playing a, a map that's basically not archipelago or fractal or uh, um, islands and content like islands maps, then he he's his units are <laughs> like what you want to do with them is basically null and void, right? Pangea maps. All right, you better hope that the AI settles uh, settles a coastal city because I mean, what are you gonna do with your uh, what are you gonna do with your Viking longship? Uh, are you gonna you gonna swim on land? Like, what's going on? Um, the the that that is the big caveat. His pillaging is insane, though. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch my coastal raiding video. Uh, coastal raid only. No building. No, I'm not building. I don't build any districts. You just do coastal raiding with Harold. And uh, but if you do it on like an archipelago map map fractal map something like that it's insane it's insanely strong so i think balancing all of those things together uh kind of puts him right in the middle of c tier i think that's a really good spot for him because on one hand he can be absolutely insane on the correct map like doing coastal raids going crazy taking cities with a really strong boat early in the game but if you have him on a fractal map or, i mean sorry like a pangea even a seven seas honestly or a continents uh you kind of just um you take away what he's good at so uh right in the middle of the pack there good balance between the two and i, I think harold is uh um harold's just a decent sieve in that in that aspect all right this next one i'm actually surprised i had her so high uh, i thought she would be lower but uh lady six sky is uh in c tier here um she's literally right like directly middle of the pack c tier um and with that i think it's it's one of those aspects where um, her her abilities are like her Holche are insanely strong. Uh, Holche are her unique units. They replace the archer. Uh, they have insane combat strength when you're attacking uh, in your territories, plus attacking weak units. Um, so you can defend basically anybody attacking you. Um, even like early game Scythia or Mongolia, uh, you almost don't even want to upgrade them to to crossbowmen. Um, so having Holche are really strong. Not having to worry about fresh water settles is really uh, unique. Um, and I think it can work out to your advantage a lot of the times. Um, that can also work out to your disadvantage, not having early housing. Uh, but the biggest thing for Lady Six Sky and the reason why I have her uh, so low, um, and I think she could actually be lower, especially if you don't play with BBS, which is the better balanced start mod, um, is that it is sometimes impossible to gain bonuses for her observatories. Uh, which if you are unfamiliar with the Maya, they have a unique campus. It's called the observatory and you gain adjacencies from farms and you gain adjacencies from plantations. There are, there've been multiple times I've run this test so many times. People have seen it on stream where you, you have starts and you literally have no plantations. You literally have no luxury resources to make plantations. So now you have to rely on farms for adjacency bonuses and having farms for adjacency bonuses. When you're trying to district around a government plaza, maybe trying to put an observatory, um, uh, next to you know your government plaza, like a commercial hub, and then getting farms around that sometimes can be impossible when you only get two farms, <laughs> and so and so you only get a minor bonus for that. So now you're now you only get plus one adjacency bonuses from from your campus when you can just play a sieve like you can play you just play Scotland and put your your campus in between mountain tiles, and now you have a plus four campus, right? It's just one of those things where. It's it's a it sounds good in concept, but in practicality and reality, it just it just doesn't work a lot of the times. Um, 
And so with that, I mean that that drags her down so much. If if she had a little bit more reliable rel reliability in gaining adjacency bonuses on her campuses, then maybe she would be higher. But uh, aside from that, it is yeah it, that that brings her down. Playing with her is fun. I will say playing Lady Six Sky is fun. She's challenging. Um, she does make the game fun. Uh, being able to do the the hexagon of of cities within 13 you can build 13 tile you can rely or if you get the perfect setup you can have 13 cities in her like six tile yield range of her capital that is also really hard to do too the fact that if you you know if you're playing a game you're more than likely not going to be able to do that and sometimes you have to settle further than six tiles away from her capital so now you get negative 15 percent to all of your yields it's it's it is can be really difficult to play her so taking all of that into consideration i think c is c is okay I, I almost brought her down to d um but she can be strong so i don't know that's where i have it c tier is uh is is for miss lady six sky over here going back to catherine here of france um we're going with uh with um uh black queen catherine uh and she's also in c tier here uh she she is arguably the the better of the of the french uh, leaders um w with her she she gains the the extra uh like i said the extra diplomatic visibility um and also getting the spy once you get castles a free spy and extra spy capacity so you can start building spies immediately so now you'll have three spies by the time you get um you know like intelligence agency out if you run her with intelligence agency you just you have so many spies everywhere which allows you to siphon funds steal great works all those things it's really really nice um and then if you play her like you should well, if you play her like she's intended, by using spies to steal great works, you can uh, build chateaus everywhere. You can build wonders that that can store the great works. Um, and so, and you also get because you get plus twenty percent production towards medieval, renaissance, and industrial era wonders, which are wonders that are going to be built holding great works. That synergizes really well with the timing you get with spies. Um, so you can you can do a lot of really cool tourism stuff and it doubles the tourism from the wonders of any era too so you want to build a lot of wonders with her uh you want to get a lot of great works going um and then you also have the chateau which is a a pretty decent uh um pretty decent tile improvement and unfortunately cannot be placed to another chateau so that was a nerf uh that was really nice being able to just line them up <laughs> so but you do get tourism equal to its culture and being able to get extra culture uh um getting plus four culture from each uh each chateau is, is is pretty nice and then spamming them everywhere you, you just kind of treat them as like paradezas or uh, uh alcazars from from granada so um she's pretty good she's better than magnificence catherine catherine that's that's like a no-brainer uh she's still not like incredible you can do domination stuff with her like you, you can do that her guard imperials are really strong so um with her uh i think a, a high c tier is is pretty nice uh pretty fair for her compared to the the civs that are above her Next on the list, we go straight to Vanilla Mongolia, um, Vanilla Genghis Khan. Uh, he is a Civ that is just, I talked about it earlier in multiplayer, he is a fiend. He is like, you have to ban him if you're playing multiplayer Vanilla uh, and you're not playing with BBG. Um, but with, with that, his Mongolia does one thing and one thing well, and that is go to war. Uh, you get the extra diplomatic visibility and gain extra combat strength from going to war, which is kind of crazy. Like it's it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, a lot of combat strength. Um, the Keshigs are really strong too. They're a ranged uh, cavalry unit. You get them with stirrups, um, and uh, they do require ten uh, horses to train. However, um, so there is like the the strategic resource. Um, uh, you have to build you have to gain strategic resources with them, but they do have a, a horse bias, so you generally will be able to build them. With him, I mean, I think with 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 Mongolia, the problem with them is that they don't really scale into the late game. Uh, they have a, a timing attack that you can hit, and after that, they just don't really scale that much. So it's just one of those sieves that once again they're they're good at what they do, but they just don't. Outside of that, they don't have a lot going for them. So I think C tier for Mongolia is strong. I think it's a good rating. Uh, I don't know. I, I just I, there's not much to say about Mongolia. Just right straight C tier. Okay, after the uh, after Mongolia, geez, I. About to say, I mean, I'm just gonna say the next one. We have the Mapuche. We have Lataro. Um, Lataro is one of those sieves that uh, I hate playing against, but I don't like playing as, <laughs> especially on deity. The problem with Lataro is that in order to use his bonuses, you have to rely on some specific things happening on deity, and deity those things don't happen all the time. Um, I really, the the main one is the extra combat strength from. Uh, golden ages and that especially if you're playing a domination game so 
If you're playing a domination game, any Civ can go do like an early game uh, swordsman rush. Like that's that's not that's not that extraordinary. That's not that extraordinary. Uh, but with him, you you want to roll like you if you want to kind of steamroll and use his abilities. The AI has to be in a golden age when you're fighting against it, or their cities have to flip. And so you have to do one of two things. You either have to rely on them to get a golden age, which there will be civs that get golden ages in the classical era um, if you don't kill them uh, in their like next to you. That does happen a lot of the time. Um, but after that, you have to rely on them to have a big military to like if they don't have a golden age, because if you kill a unit, the city loses 20 loyalty uh, or if they're in a golden age, they lose 40 loyalty. So you have to do that, cause the city to flip and. Um, and then to get the extra combat strength from the free city. And that just doesn't, that is, that is so hard to do. That is so hard to have achieve or so hard to have happen in your games that it just like, you can kind of just kiss your abilities goodbye and not use them. It's just like, I don't know. He, he did get a, like, you know, the, the buff that he was supposed to get. Well, he did get in, uh, in the last patch. It's, it's okay. It's whatever. Um, you know, extra culture and production toward in combat experience towards units trained in the city that has a governor like that's cool um for me the way that i look at it is that if you're playing domination on dad you're generally not building units all game you're building a core group of units that you send throughout the, the map through the rest of the game that you level up and promote and turn them into uh uh different units throughout the rest of the game and you're not really building you may build like one or two new ones so the extra production and combat experience it's it's whatever it's fine it's nice to have in the beginning of the game, I guess. So, um, Chemimuls, eh, don't really care about that tile. Don't care, care about that tile improvement. Uh, they have to be on breathtaking tiles, which if you're playing Domination, you're probably not going to have that many. So they're, they're kind of useless in that aspect. Uh, uh, Molin Raiders, fantastic unit. I will get, they are, they are one of the best units in the game. I love them. They are incredible. So that is, that is a big plus for, uh, for the Mapuche. Molin Raiders are, absolutely incredible like um extra combat strength within four tiles of territory pillaging only costs one movement like let's let's go don't require any uh strategic resources incredible unit so right there right in this uh high c tier for the mapuche um i think they do they're a good example of of knowing what they can, what knowing what you can do with them and if things work out for you they're great but if not then you're just a normal vanilla sieve without any abilities so uh, that's where i have the mapuche Man, we just get we're just getting like all the all the horsey sieves out of the way, aren't we? <laughs> um, uh, after after all this, we have Scythia here. Uh, Scythia is a is I find Scythia similar to how Mongolia plays, um, where they only really want to do one thing, and that's kill you with horses. <laughs> uh, she so the Saka horse archers, they are uh, they're another incredible unit. Um, but the problem with Saka horse archers is that they just don't scale into the game. Um, I find a lot of the times ranged cavalry units just don't scale well. Uh, they are they start off really strong when, in in their timing when you can get them, and then after that it's it's a not like they're just not a they don't they don't scale. Um, so so with Scythia, uh, the Saka horse archers you get them you can get them uh, really early on right. Um, they are unlocked by horseback riding. They don't require horses. Really fast, strong units that kind of just uh, zerg the the AI or zerg the other player with them. So, um, uh, additionally, if you build a light cavalry or you build a Saka horse archer, you get a second copy of that. So that's like an insane ability. Just being, once you unlock Saka horse archers and you have two cities that have a lot of production, can pump them out. You can gain a huge army of them really fast, uh, which is really strong. Um, the problem is I don't like light calves. I don't like light cavalry units, so that's why I, I don't think it's like if you use them for soccer horse archers, that's great. But for like building like coursers, for example, and it's not not super into building coursers. Uh, there are better units. Um, Kurgans, eh. like uh, they got a buff. They do provide tourism. Don't really care about them when you're trying to do horsey dom stuff. So. Uh, with her high C tier, a little bit below D B tier is, I think, pretty fair for her. And, and that's, uh, those are my feelings on Scythia. We are about to exit C tier. Um, and, and with that, uh, I have, uh, we only have two sieves left. Uh, they're very similar in, in how they play. Uh, but the first one we have the one, the only, our waifu, uh, Cleopatra. Um, with, with Cleo, she is one of those sieves that I think the 
the modded leader of, I think, Sucratax Egypt is kind of how C is supposed to be played. Um, you can gain a lot of gold and food from trade routes with her, the way that she is, the way that her kit is, is built. Uh, as well as you can build a lot of wonders really fast because of the 15% production towards uh, towards wonders and districts next to a, a river. Um, and also the fact that they're immune to damage from floods is really nice considering her bias is floodplains. Uh, I think the Sphinx, I think the buff that Sphinx has got were pretty nice. Extra culture and faith and appeal uh, and additional faith next to a wonder. So you want to place them next to wonders. But the problem with that is that they also... Um, uh, with them, they cannot be placed to another Sphinx. So if you're building, if you're going to build a Wonder, you kind of want to place them in, in opposite sides of the Wonder, which can take up precious slots for like throwing theater squares there. So it is kind of it is kind of tricky and a little weird in placing them. Um, the Chariot Archer is a great unit. It replaces the heavy cat, uh, the heavy chariot. Um, and uh, well, actually, no, it doesn't. It doesn't replace it, right? It's its own unit. Uh, let me look at the. Let me look. So it's its own unit. Um, and uh, I think it's a good it's a good unit. It's uh, it's one of those things that's similar. A lot of those a lot of those ranged uh, like fast units are good units for their era. Um, and then after that, obviously, they just turn into a regular unit. Uh, so I don't know. Cleo's good. I don't think she's good enough to be B tier. Um, I think if you played if if Sucratax version of Egypt was in the base game and that's that was Egypt, then I think she would be B tier. I think she'd be better than she is now. Which if you don't know what that is. Uh, Egypt, Sucratax Egypt gains a unique district. It's a, a unique industrial zone, 50% um, cheaper, uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll list her abilities up here with that. And I think that would be make her B tier, but right now we have her in C tier, and I think that's pretty fair. Uh, just not just not good enough. Sorry, sorry, Cleo. Uh, and then jumping straight off the back of Cleo, uh, we have someone who is kind of similar in what she does, uh, but. It, I think is the best out of the um, the best out of the the two Kublai Khan for sure is uh, is, is is China's Kublai. Whoops, that's Teddy. where are you going, Teddy? Is China's Kublai Khan? Um, China's Kublai Khan is like I said. Like I said, I, I just repeated myself. Is the better of the two. Um, he gets the uh, he gets the extra bonuses or the extra economic policy card, um, as well as the extra eurekas uh, of science and, and culture from completing texts and civics. So. With that, I think, um, I think that uh, compared to Mongolia version of this, it just synergizes a lot well. You can use, you know, the economic policy card uh, by running like Corvée and uh, urban planning and being able to get some early game wonders really fast. Um, additionally, you can also, you know, getting the Eurekas and Inspirations, getting the extra 10% science and culture can snowball. If you're really good at, at getting your Eurekas and Inspirations, you can snowball. Um, you can snowball things really well, which allows you allows you to get wonders faster, which allows you to get those inspirations and eurekas from uh, a wonder from that era. So it, it, it can snowball pretty fast with him. Um, I don't think he's as good as as, as vanilla China, uh, but I do think he is he is just a, like a step down from him. So that is where I have Kublai Khan China. I think he's a pretty decent sieve, and I think just under B tier is, is pretty fair. Jumping out of C tier, C tier, uh, we're gonna go right to our first B tier sieve. Um, and I think this one is this is this is a good example of what I had uh, talked about of being just a good sieve. And I think B tier is just B tier is a straight is a just a solid sieve. Like all the sieves that are in B tier, they're just solid sieves. There's nothing like incredibly exceptional about them. Like they don't gain, they don't have like this insane ability that allows them to be the like way you know a, t a whole tier above everyone else. Um, I think B tier is just a good solid and a good solid tier for sieves. And I think Vic Vicky is a, a great example of that, right? She has a really, really cheap uh, um, uh, harbor, the Royal Navy Dockyard. She has a decent uh, military navy unit that gets unlocked with a Civic, the Sea Dog. Um, she gains extra production towards uh, towards industrial zone buildings. Uh, she gets extra strategic resources. All of the stuff that you want to do with with Vicky um, synergizes. Like everything that you want to do works really well. And the fact that you get like a real a free melee unit of that city. Uh, whenever you build a Royal Navy dockyard, um, outside of the outside of the content, it's just it's just this just works really well for her. She has so much synergy in all of the things that she wants to do. All of her units are really good. The red coat is really good. The sea dog is really good. Having a half cost harbor is always really good. 
Um, everything about her just works really well. Um, it's not like super overpowered. It's a really just middle of the pack sieve. And I think, I think it's just a really good, I think Vicky is a really good example of just like a really solid middle ground sieve. So that's where we have Vicky. She's at the bottom of the B tier. Um, but I think, I mean, I think she's just a good sieve overall. Uh, and jumping off the back of her, we're gonna actually going to go straight back to China and we're going with vanilla China, uh, I had just talked, we had just talked about Kublai Khan China, and I think Vanilla China does what Kublai Khan wants to do, but a little bit better. Um, the fact that you can get the, the fact that you can use builder charges to build ancient and classical era wonders is just like bonkers. <laughs> like you can gain so many good, good wonders early on. You can like, like guarantees you pyramids on deity. It can guarantee you like a Temenanki on deity, right? Like these wonders that are really hard to get because uh, they're gone by like turn 35 are basically guaranteed by getting like two builders out so if you wanted to get pyramids and you have a tile you have a tile that you can build it on just get just build two builders really quickly and then you can just use builder charges to, to build it really like in four builder charges so uh a really strong sieve um they're they're the bonus the charges for builders is just i don't know is it's really good i think it's really good i think the the great wall can be good um, it can be really hard and finicky to build it because if you settle a city that connects to your borders outside of where your Great Wall is, then it doesn't, sometimes you can mess up the lines and gaining the yields that you want to get from it. So it can be finicky. It is good. Gives you a lot of tourism. Um, the Crouching Tiger is, is a really good unit, I think. Um, the, the problem with it is that you can't really use it offensively. You can't, negative 17, hold on, I have to look it up. I think it's negative 17. Yeah, negative 17 combat strength versus districts is uh, is kind of silly. But so you want to use it as like a defensive unit, which makes sense, right? You're going to build the Great Wall. You're going to use the Crouching Tigers to defend yourself while you're building all the wonders. So um, China, Vanilla China, B tier, really solid sieve. Nothing else to say about them other than that. Oh, Cyrus. <laughs> oh, Cyrus, how you've fallen. Cyrus used to be one of the best sieves in the game, um, at least to me. I think, I mean, he's still good, right? He's still still in B tier, but he used to be really, really strong. And I think the nerf on Paradezas, uh, the nerf on Paradezas kind of just, you didn't realize how strong Paradezas were until uh, until they got nerfed. Um, it, it just, and then also they buffed some other sieves that just made them better, that, made, that were better than him. So uh, he is another sieve where they split him into two do you want to go domination or do you want to go culture if you go culture you can do very strong things with culture if you go domination you have insane movement when you declare a surprise war right so it's it, it's just one of those sieves where if you do one or the other you're gonna have a good time now the fact that they nerfed paradezas where you only get the plus one appeal and plus plus two um on top of the fact that earth goddess got nerfed that's something i have actually haven't talked about here is with earth goddess getting nerfed some of the sieves that used to be super strong and dependent on it dropped down a little bit and and persia is one of them because you could spam paradeza everywhere uh, on your map and then get earth goddess and get an insane amount of faith because you're gonna get plus two appeal from every tile that paradezas are on which means you're gonna get a ton of breathtaking tiles which means you can just do paradeza only tile improvement tourism um but I mean, that's kind of a niche strategy, but if you spammed Paradezas and you're going culture and you wanted to build national parks and rock bands, you can reliably gain a ton of faith by going Earth Goddess with uh, Paradezas on your map. So the fact that that got nerfed, both of them got nerfed, kind of brings Cyrus down a bit from A tier to B tier. Uh, Immortals are still an, an incredible unit, one of the best units in the entire game, uh, top tier for sure, which is why I still have them in, in B tier here. So Cyrus, B tier, dropped a tier, uh, and that's where I have them at. We are moving on to, oh, where are you? Brazil, Pedro. This was kind of a controversial one too. A lot of people thought Pedro should be a lot higher than he was. Um, I still think Pedro is a good sieve. I still think he's in B tier. Um, and yeah, he's a good sieve. The problem with Pedro, and you'll notice a lot of the, the sieves in this in this tier, is that he he relies a lot on his starting position um, and, and his main ability of um getting you know if you, you'll need to use what, what is it called the pantheon that gets you extra adjacency bonuses to um to rainforest sacred path so the fact that you do get the extra adjacency bonuses from his regular ability next to jungle uh is nice but that also means you have to spawn next to jungle he does have a jungle bias but in vanilla without bbs sometimes you don't get any jungle at all and then you know 
he just kind of becomes basically useless like his, his ability becomes useless um and I already mentioned it earlier, but that's a reoccurring theme. If your if your ability your bonus becomes useless, then that that drops you down a little bit as a sieve. Um, but if you can get sacred path, which is actually really hard to get on on deity, I've had people argue with me, to being like, just get sacred path. It's super easy. Like, and I don't know what sieve games you're playing, but I did a test. I ran a test of ten games non BBS trying to get sacred path, and nine times out of ten, I could not get sacred path. Every single time, even with the extra. Um, even with like, I think the only time I ever got it was when I got a relic or, uh, it was, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was either, I either got a relic or there were no like actual faith-based civs in the game. So getting, getting sacred path is difficult. Um, so, uh, so with that, the, after that his, I mean, you're not going to be built building street carnivals that much. Uh, maybe you're going to use it for, for Coliseum. Maybe use it for your theater square adjacencies. Uh, you will be building the Copacabana quite a bit, though. It, it is a it is a water park that it doesn't take up a slot on the coast, so or it takes up a slot on the coast, but you don't really care about that that much, especially in 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 uh, culture games. So I like that district. Um, yeah, I think B I think B tier is, is is completely fair for for Pedro. I know a lot of people like think he's S tier. I don't think so, just because of how much he depends on the jungle aspect the jungle factor is a huge aspect and uh, not getting that is uh is pretty is pretty awful so uh b tier for pedro on the other side of things with uh with with pedro that was brazil we have we have the cold side of things we have canada we have wilfred here um i actually had canada a little bit lower uh even with post patch but i think i played him a little bit incorrectly the last time i played him before my tile my my tourism game um and with his buffs that he received plus his starting bias even running on vanilla i i tended to have at least one to two camps near me i still tended to have you know um a decent start and because of him being able to gain food and uh, and production and stuff like that from farms and camps in the tundra you you want to build those you basically kind of he's one of the few sieves where you want to get a builder early on and when you do you're you're set you are very very set getting those getting the food on tundra tiles getting the mines is so is like is actually really good with him so um canada he's, he's gotten buffed quite a bit in the last patch and that's a huge one. And the next big one is the Mountie aspect. Now, with Canada, you can do some insane tourism, national national park tourism games with them because now Mounties gain two charges for national parks instead of just the one before. So you want to do a high faith based game with with Canada, which you can do um, because Tundra tiles a lot of the times have woods on them, which makes them charming and breathtaking. Which means you can go Earth Goddess with him. So going Earth Goddess with Canada getting a lot of faith, putting holy sites down, and then using your faith to build Grandmaster's Chapel in your government plaza um, means you can faith buy Mounties. You can, also you can also produce them as well. But the thing with government plaza, unlike rock bands and national parks, which scale in, you know, in civilian units, which uh, get more expensive as the game goes on to purchase them, um, military units stay the same. And I think with Theocracy and they're only 480 faith on standard speed, I believe. So if you're gaining like 500 faith per turn by the time you get Mounties, you know, you can get a, a a cheaper double naturalist by only spending 480 faith per turn and getting two national park charges out of it, which is insane. And then you can use those Mounties to do to fend yourself, you know, in that time frame as well. So that buffed Canada, like that them getting two build charges is just it it, it made him an actually an actual good sieve. So uh, Canada, Wilfred. Um, you are in B tier. You're right in the middle of the pack, or right, right in B tier. Really good sieve. Nothing, nothing too much to say there. Jumping from some culture sieves here, we have a, a primarily uh, domination focused sieve here, um, and that is that is coming up with uh, with Suleiman of the Ottoman Empire. Um, Suleiman is a very he's he's a good example of a very good sieve that knows exactly what what he wants to do and is going to do it very well. Um, Suleiman is incredible at domination, uh, being able to get 50% production towards siege units. That's just crazy. Plus extra combat strength on top of a governor that gives them combat strength within specific amounts of tiles around them. I think it's 10 tiles. I think it's 10 tiles from the city that the governor is in. Um, 
which uh which is with uh ibrahim who's uh i think it's 10 tiles let me look i, can, I have it up right now um ba -ba -ba. yep grants all units within 10 tiles of the city center plus 10 combat strength when attacking defensible districts so now not only do you get the extra plus five combat strength now you're getting if you have ibrahim in a city within 10 tiles which if you're playing domination you should because you're going to keep us you're going to keep those cities you can leapfrog ibrahim in between cities and now you're getting 15 combat strength on top of your your siege units so very strong sieve um the only caveat is the only downfall is that he needs niter uh he does he did gain a buff in the last patch where his um where he spawns near niter more often uh but since he is kind of that's all he can do really is just go to war uh that's why i have him straight down in b tier because that's it's just he's really good at what he does um but he doesn't really excel with anything else so b tier for Suleiman. All right, and from there, uh, we're going to actually one of my favorite sieves in the game that I uh, that I feel I want to play more often, and I don't get a lot of chance to play her. But uh, is is Indonesia is Guitarja. Um I think she's I think she's actually. I mean, with, with the way that I rank her, I want to say I think she's better than than she is. Um, but I I, I I don't know if that makes any sense. I, in my mind, I think she's one of the best sieves in the game. But when you play her and you put her on paper and you and like in practicality, she's she's just a good sieve. Um, she has the the fact that you can faith by boats. I think is really really cool. Um, I like her the synergy that she has in regards to you know being a faith based naval sieve. I think is pretty is just a really cool, um, a really cool idea with uh, with Katarja. I love the kampongs. Like the sp kampong spamming is so they're such a good it's such a good improvement. Like it's such a good tile improvement. It's one of the best in the games. Like it gives you production. It gives you housing. It gives you food from every like fishing boats. Um, it, and once you get to tourism, it provides, or once you get to flight, it provides tourism. So you can do tourism stuff reliably with, with her. Now, the caveat is that it has, she has to be on the sea. If you're, you know, playing a Pangea map, you're more than likely not going to have a lot of coastal cities. So there is a little bit of map dependency there, um, which is, it brings her down just a little bit. Um, but also, but, but aside, you know, and then since she is dependent on the sea, you don't get the extra adjacency bonuses from being on a coastal tile or a lake tile. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're playing a Pangea map, if you're playing a continents map, there is a possibility that you don't even get that ability. So um, I think with that, you know, comparing to what I was saying earlier, where I think she's an incredible sieve, in reality, she's a good sieve that, you know, gets has some dependency issues. So um, other than that, I mean, I, I, re I love Guitarja. I think she's a great sieve. Um, I think she's so much fun to play. Uh, she's one of my favorite civs to play, um, even if she's not like S tier. So, uh, Guitarja, Indonesia, right in the middle of the pack of B tier. Uh, just a just a good civ overall. Oh, Scotland, you may be the worst music. That's Russia, worst music in the game, but you're not the worst civ in the game. Um, Robert the Bruce, uh, another just really good solid civ. Um, the the his his synergy between uh what you want to do with uh with campuses and going to going to space just works out really well um especially with the buff to amenities that was a couple patches ago making amenities being important uh means that his ability of gaining extra science um and production and extra great scientist and engineer points from happy cities uh, i think it's plus five percent a lot more valuable uh, you double those yields when they are ecstatic so you'll want to you know build Colosseum, build uh, temple of artemis things like that as uh, as scotland and making sure that you have you know golf courses in your cities which is a unique infrastructure in providing as much amenities as you can in your cities if you can get a religion get a religion and giving yourself high amenity bonuses you know like stupas and stuff like that but that's not required um, I think he's, he's just a good Civ. Uh, you know, War of Liberation is pretty cool. Um, but aside from that, like just the extra science stuff with his abilities and making your cities happy, he's one of those few Civs that you can go tall in Civilization Six by going and going Audience Chamber instead of Ancestral Hall, which does synergize really well with his amenities, uh, amenity abilities. So, um, try playing him on uh, doing a one city challenge, and you'll find it actually it's actually not too difficult. So, yeah, Robert, right in the middle. Really good sieve, just a just a really good decent sieve overall. Um, this one here, I, th I think this was actually another controversial, <laughs> controversial sieve uh, last time. But the coupe of the the Maori here, um, or the Maori uh, coupe, 
I, I think I honestly don't remember what I rated him last time. I'll have to look at it. Uh, maybe I'll throw it in here when I'm editing this. Uh, but I, I think I valued Coupe a little bit less back then than I do now. Um, he's he's one of those sieves that if you get him going, um, you know, obviously you can do the, the, the cheese shenanigans where you play a Terra map and you colonize the entire second continent, right? But that's, I don't really, I don't know, that's pretty cheesy. But the fact that you, you, you can start with sh sailing and shipbuilding um, and then obviously you can sail to wherever you want is is pretty cool you know that can also be terrible if you start on a terrible map and you you scout west and you end up in tundra that's you know awful you don't necessarily want that to happen um but the fact that you can gain the extra yields from not building lumber mills and stuff like that on your range forests on your woods um you know as the game goes on and it scales really well is is really nice he, he he's just a strong sieve uh when you get him going um there, there isn't too much to talk about him. The the Toa, nice, unique swordsman. Um, doesn't require any resources, so that's that's pretty nice. Um, the Marae is a is a decent building. Um, nothing crazy. Like it's it's not like a a, a crazy unique um, building. Like for example, uh, Portugal's unique building is, um, or or Saladin's uh, Arabia's unique building is. But it's not a bad one. So. Yeah, I think I think I rated him pretty badly in the last one. I think bumping him up to the middle of the pack in in uh, in B tier is uh, is a, is a pretty nice gesture, and I I think that's just where he belongs in in the game, at least for single player. Multiplayer, then he's he's just a griefer. <laughs> and uh, and speaking of Salah uh of Arabia, uh, he is next. He is also B tier. Um, I think I don't remember what I rated him. I think I rated him pretty poorly in the last game. Uh, I played him again, and I played him a couple times off stream. Um, and I, I think this is one of those ones where I definitely didn't understand how to play him that well. And I didn't rate him. I didn't give him the rating that he deserved. Uh, the fact that you are guaranteed a religion no matter what, I think should have just like that should have just set off alarm bells in my head. And, and uh, you get it. You get a guarantee. You get a guaranteed religion. Like no matter what you do, your religion is guaranteed, which means no matter what type of victory condition you want, you want to do, you're going to have a religion to back that up. Now, if you're not going to go religion, that just means you have extra bonuses that you can rely on, right? You can you can build a holy site, and if you're going uh, science, which he does excel at, you can you know um, get not world church, but the other one that is uh, the science per uh, followers that you have in your cities. You know, uh, complementing your science stuff that you want to do with him uh, is is pretty nice. Um, madrasas are pretty good. Plus five science that gets boosted, you know, by rationalism. Uh, it gives you science equal to your your adjacency bonus or faith equal to your adjacency bonus. Um, gives you extra housing. Like it's a decent university replacement. Um, Mamluks are very strong, very very strong. Uh, ignores the enemy zone of control um, and it heals at the end of every turn. Just an incredible unit. Uh, but yeah, Saladin, good good sieve. I should have I should have. Given him given him a higher score last time, but uh, with this one, yeah, just keeping him right in B tier, I think, is uh, a really good place for him. And we're going next with with someone that I've actually come to really enjoy playing lately, which is a surprise, because I've started to veer away from domination and go towards more cultural sieves. Um, but with with this, we have Montezuma up in B tier here. I I've been enjoying playing him lately. I've been enjoying doing like silly things like uh, Eagle Warrior Rush, like you know, chopping out eagle warriors with vampires and doing shenanigans like that. Um, I like doing science stuff with, with the Aztecs. I think he does a pretty good job at doing science because you can use your builder charges to complete district production costs. So you can use builders to spam out um, spaceports really fast. You also can get an insane amount of uh, amenities with luxury resources. So if you have a lot of luxury resources around your cities, you gain amenities, build Colosseum, build Teleport of, of Artemis, get your cities really ecstatic and happy, which allows gives you extra production and food and growth, which means you can go to space really fast. So uh, Monty up in B tier, I think it's a pretty good, um, pretty good spot for him. Uh, since you are gonna be building the entertainment complex, to gain extra amenities with him uh his arena placement um is pretty nice it's the extra i don't i don't really care about the yields from it like the plus two faith whatever it, it doesn't matter the general points per turn i mean i guess if you're if you're going domination you're probably not building a <laughs> entertainment complex so i've always thought the uh i've always thought the um the yields that you get from it are really strange which is why i don't care about it uh but if you are building a coliseum are you building an entertainment complex for a coliseum for for science stuff or whatever? Then it, it's it's fine. So, 
Uh, Monty up there in B tier. Um, I think this is one of those sieves that uh, a lot of people don't really think about being versatile, um, but he, he can be pretty versatile and, and uh, not just go domination. So Montezuma of the Aztecs, B tier. Uh, and from here, we have Alex of Macedon. Um, Alex is one of my favorite sieves. Uh, he was he was one of my favorite sieves for a very, very long time. And you know, I'm actually going to do one of these on the fly things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop Alex uh, to C tier here. <laughs> um, in that may, he was in B tier. I'm actually dropping him to C tier. And the main reason is because of how unversatile and how dependent he is on... Uh, uh, his entire kit, uh, for example. Now, he, he can be very, very incredibly strong for domination. Um, you know, if you conquer a city, you get the free Eureka for each encampment in, and campus in the city. Um, you also, all of your city units heal to full if uh, it has a wonder. Um, but the problem with that, and, I, and there's a video coming out uh, sometime this month where I'm comparing uh, some things, and I ran a test with Alex because he's very, he's very strategic resource dependent. And... I think it was like seven out of my seven out of ten of the maps that I rolled. Uh, yeah, only seven of them had one or the other of the strategic resource that you needed. He has two unique units: the Heteroi and the Hypaspist. Uh, the Hypaspist require iron. Heteroi require horses. There were three maps that I rolled that I didn't have a a chunk of iron or a spot for horses in four of my cities. In four of my first four cities. And if you don't have that, you just become a vanilla sieve. So considering how dependent on resources he is, and if you don't get those resources, you only get the, the bonus abilities from taking over cities, which means if you don't have iron, then you know you have to rely on warriors or you have to like wait till late game to do stuff, which kind of just, like I said, turns him to a vanilla sieve. So I'm dropping him from B to C tier. Um, his dependencies, now that I think about it, just, you know, cause it's been a long time since I've played Alex. Now that I've played about it, like his dependencies are, are, are pretty, pretty god awful. Um, and that's just going to bring him down to C tier. So C tier for Alex. Uh, I thought I was out of there, but apparently Alex just drags me right back in. And and with another sieve here that I I think I rated pretty poorly last time, but they are a pretty decent sieve overall is, is this lady right here, Wilhelmina of the Dutch. Um, I think she's a sieve that I know some people consider. I, I mean, I do kind of consider her a little boring, but um, cause she's, there's nothing that about her that is super outstanding. Uh, but everything that she does is good. I think the buff, the early buff that they gave her from the last patch where you get the, the extra loyalty and culture per turn from um, from trade routes is pretty nice. Uh, but the main part of Valhamina that I love, I love polders. Now, obviously, you can't get polders every time. They are a little spawn dependent based on, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you spawn inland or not. But her ability to get extra adjacency bonuses next to rivers is is pretty crazy is actually pretty crazy you can get some really high adjacency campuses and industrial zones and commercial hubs if you build them in little little triangles next to your your city center on a river and a lot of the time she spawns on rivers next to mountains so you can get like plus five campuses plus four izs and plus six like commercial hubs really easily on on uh, on a river next to your city center so I think they're I think she's really good that that makes her pretty versatile and being to do whatever you want to do obviously she gears a little bit towards science um, than everything else but you can do culture if you wanted to you can do domination uh, religion is kind of like a weak point with her um, since you don't get the extra adjacencies but uh, yeah Wilhelmina I think she is a sleeper sieve I think she's a sieve that if you don't think about it if you don't if you like ignore her and forget about her, she's going to kind of do what she wants to do and, and have crazy yields. And you're not going to, you're going to be like, where did she come from? So, well, Wilhelmina right in the middle of pack of the B tier, I think is a pretty strong ranking for her. Now I just realized I passed over someone for Wilhelmina, but she's just, just below her. Uh, so we're going to go Eleanor of Aquitaine, but the French version, we'll, we'll put, uh, we'll put them over. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me move everything over here so we can, we can put her in here. Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, the French, uh, uh, the Aquitaine, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but, um, of France, I think that she is a sieve that this is a good, going back to what I said with, with the English version, I think all of her ideas synergize really well with Eleanor. I think, um, you know, gaining, uh, Chateau, like building wonders that, um, in the medieval Renaissance and industrial era, generally they, the ones that you want to build for culture generally have slots for great works. If you have a city that has a great work, 
and it's near a city, any city within nine tiles loses one loyalty per turn. So if you're spamming wonders, if you're spamming great works and stuff like that, you're going to start loyalty flipping cities around you. And that's just the way to play her is as a, it's a passive, um, peaceful domination game where you want to build culture and you want to flip cities around her. And I think all of her, everything works really well together with her. Um, you can spam chateaus as well. Uh, and that makes her just a really good tourism sieve, um, right? Like right up there in the middle of the pack, next to next to the Dutch, and what that you know what the, you know what you want to do with her, and she does it well. So, uh, yeah, B tier for for uh, El, for Ellie, the better Ellie of the two. Uh, I can't believe I almost skipped over her. That was actually pretty funny. Uh, but with, with that, I'm gonna go into the uh, probably arguably a sieve that could be one of the best in the entire game if he was not so dependent on everything and that is joao of portugal I, I i've been trying to learn how to pronounce joao i think it's i think it's pronounced like joao like there's like a nasally consonant with the the or there's a nasal sound in pronouncing his name but I, anyways i want to i if, if you if i pronounce things wrong please tell me i want to know how to pronounce them i want to learn how to pronounce things you know uh, it, it, I've always like told people if you know I can if people can like pronounce Tchaikovsky you know uh, then I can learn how to pronounce uh, everything else. So, um, but with Portugal, I say this: Portugal is is easily the perfect example of a sieve that could be the best sieve in the game, better than anyone else. But because he is so dependent on being in an archipelago map or a fractal map, you know, a, a coastal sieve where every single city. Um, in the game it has to be on a coast uh, that brings him like way down he could super super easily be s tier um, very easily be s tier if you've watched my games if you've watched my tourism game that I've done with him if you watch my I mean I did a one city challenge almost sub 200 one city challenge with him like almost a sub 200 on standard speed on deity with 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 him if I got a little bit better in the tech if I got luck better luck with the tech tree and I didn't miss out on Oxford we would have gotten a sub 200 and so um, the reason being is because you can only trade with cities on the coast or if they have a harbor, uh, but you gain an, a 50% increase to all of your yields. You also have a 50% range increase too for, for naval trade routes, which is just bonkers. Then you have the navigation school, which is a university replacement. You gain extra plus one science for every two coastal lake tiles, two coasts or lake tiles in that city. <laughs> That's insane. Like I've seen, I've seen some of my navigation schools like literally have like plus twelve science. Like it's just bonkers. It's just absolutely bonkers. Like absolutely bonkers. Um, it also gives you, you know, the normal stuff like housing, citizen slots, and stuff like that. Uh, and then you have the unique unit, the nows, which um, are they they build a unique tile improvement called a Fatoria, which gives you, uh, which gives you crazy gold being uh, which you can only place them in uh in friendly territories so you have to have like open borders or something like that in friendly territories but they give you extra gold i think it's plus four gold um and then you then it increases uh uh f or no you get plus four gold and then you get plus four gold on top of the trade routes as well so trading to cities with Fatoria's just absolutely bonkers like he's the mansa musa of the sea it's just, he's, like I said, if you if you play him on a Pangea map, he's just one of the worst sieves in the game. But if you play him Archipelago, if you play him on a Fractal map, on a, maybe maybe even a Continents and Islands map, he can be S tier. But because of those dependencies, I mean, they are god-awful dependent. Like, you, you have to play on those maps, otherwise he's he's awful. So we're putting him right here, straight center of, of B tier because of that. And then piggybacking off of the dependencies, this is another one where people just can't believe that I don't have him in S tier. Um, and and we're going straight into Basil II of Byzantium. He's just another one of those sieves, once again, where he's so dependent on getting a religion. And sure, he gets some bonuses from getting a religion. He gets the extra great profit points. And it's not to say that it's super difficult to get a religion with him, because you, you can. But if you don't get a religion with him, then he becomes a vanilla sieve. All of his abilities, unless you wait for someone to convert their religion and then you can start spreading that religion, all of his abilities become useless and you have to wait until you get a, another religion. Um, that drags him down to B tier because of that. Uh, if he was able, like for example, if he had, instead of building the Hippodrome, maybe he had a unique holy site, then that would make him S tier for sure. Um, but on top of that, like the fact that he, you have to get a religion with him, you have to, or you have to wait until someone spreads their religion fully to your city and you have, 
that's the majority religion um just brings him down a bit now i'm not going to argue that he's not a good sieve like he's an incredible sieve he is his tagmas do a ton of damage um you get free tagmas taxis is a crazy ability for religious domination uh like so you you have the ability of doing doing religious domination religious stuff very very well which if you can do religion well then you can do other things well you know you can do religious science religious culture stuff like that but because his kit requires him to have a religion if you don't get that religion which happens on deity sure you can rush it and stuff like that but it happens on deity where sometimes you even if you're chopping out projects you still don't get the religion so um that's why he's in b tier people were arguing with me last time about this i'm keeping my stance he's he's not s tier in deity single player now multiplayer i think he's banned <laughs> a lot of the times because of how good he is in multiplayer but keep in mind this is single player deity that i'm talking about here and so i think b tier is just compl that's just fair that's just fair going with uh off of the top of another sieve that got buffed um and is now uh up up here in in b tier um we have mr uh mr super dramatic man who, who when he denounces you philip uh philip of spain has turned into a pretty damn good sieve um i think he's one of those sieves where if you if you if he didn't have the spawn dependency which is the continental split uh which is what is needed i mean he obviously has the better chances of spawning on one now with the the spawn bias buff that they gave him um but the continental split does remove him bring him down a little bit here but outside of that i mean the mission buff that they gave it plus two faith and then you get additionally food production if it's on a different continent than your cap and then you get plus the extra science from campuses and holy sites which gets uh plus two once you get cultural heritage um it it, it turns him into a like an actual really good science of um he can also do some really good religious dom stuff too uh you get the extra um production uh sorry you you get the uh the sorry the naval what am i saying not really some naval dom um you get armadas and fleets super early so you can get really early fleets and on a on a coastal map if you play him which is a lot of fun too i, I just think i don't know philip's just a good example of another really strong sieve that got buffed in the last patch and made him actually decent so uh high b tier for for philip i think he's a very good sieve now this one may be a little controversial um, because he can really only do one thing and one thing very, very well. Um, and I, I think this is actually one of those sieves where bias comes into play. Um, but speaking of, uh, you know what? I'm actually, I'm actually going to drop him down, I think. I think I'm actually going to drop him down um, because of his dependencies as well as his... Uh, we'll just say, we'll say, yeah, we'll say his dependencies and his versatility kind of bring him down here because he really doesn't have anything else that he can do uh is i'm gonna is, is gonna be matthias of hungary um hungary is one of my favorite civs to play in this entire game uh especially with the addition of secret societies um he's another civ that's going to go down to c tier the addition of if you add in secret societies and you get hamiko then he becomes like insane right he gets the extra uh the the cost of or the extra combat strength with levied units he gets the cheaper upgrades with levied units so if you have hamiko you can just levy units the entire game over and over and over and over and over again if you watch my matthias gameplay videos in my channel even the one era behind stuff you'll see how easy the game is with hamiko and matthias but the problem is that's kind of all he can do well right he gets sure he gets uh what what is it called the rose the thing of the rose his uh his i gotta look it up here um his unique ability uh sorry pearl pearl of the danube where he gets the, the extra 50 percent district production across the river from a city center so you do have to kind of play a little mini game there and that's really strong as well but all you really want to do is is levy units and go to war with with matthias and um if you can do that if you have city states near you that that don't get destroyed or that you can suzerain um then he turns into a very very strong sieve but because that's all he can kind of do he doesn't really have anything else that's going for him um i'm actually going to drop him from b tier to c tier even if he is one of my favorite civs especially with the uh addition of hamiko in the game and then we have two civs that are probably going to surprise you one of them is uh actually my one of my favorite civs in the entire game and that's Poundmaker. um i love the kree uh i people 
like every time I say I love the Creed, people are like, <laughs> they're so taken aback by it. And there's multiple things. I think I don't think they're an S tier Civ. I think they're another really good example, like I talked about with Vicky, of just being a jack of all trades. Um, like Poundmaker, you can kind of do whatever. Like maybe Religion is not as good as everything else, but jack of all trades, really good early game bonuses. I value early game so much because it allows you to snowball the rest of the game. The fact that you get a trader in the begin with with pottery, you get trader with the first tech that you can get um, and then the fact that the trader claims tiles as it moves the first three tiles that it goes outside of your borders it claims to that city uh, is really really strong and s as well as getting the unique infrastructure in pottery as well you get three bonuses within one tech and that's the first tech that you can get in the entire game you get the mecha wop now the mecha wop does have some uh, dependencies for adjacencies uh, you still get the extra housing and production um, from it automatically so if you put it on a hill you know you can become a 2-2 uh, gold, plus one gold um, that gives you a full house uh, full housing for your city but if you have luxury resources you get plus two extra gold if you have bon two adjacent bonus resources you get plus one food so it can turn into a like four food two production like two gold three gold tile from pottery which is a really strong but you know that that does require some dependencies so um, pound maker I mean they're they're unique uh, scout um, is good it's not like anything i don't think it's like a super op unit um you know i don't think it's uh um anything that's absolutely bonkers like a like a, a holche you know from the maya um but i think you know it's a good unit and plus you also get the the shared visibility from allies as well so i think pound maker is a one of those sleeper sieves that's just a really good sieve um one of my favorite to play uh, and i think putting them in b tier is just i think it's just like right there right at the right at the start of b tier near the top of it because he's not he he is good with everything but he's not he's a master he's a jack of all trades and a master of none um so i think that's a really good spot for him and then the next one the next sieve actually may surprise you a little bit you're probably a little especially considering with the last uh the last tier list gosh how do i words good the last tier list that we did uh i had him so high but we're going with uh frederick frederick's dropping all the way down to b tier um, after playing quite a bit, I mean, I still think Fred is Freddy is really good, but after playing quite a bit in some of the with the patches that came out um, and playing in some of the sieves that got buffed and got nerfed, uh, there are sieves that do what he wants to do, but way better. Um, and considering I value early game a lot more than I used to then, Freddy's early game is is just not good. Um, it, I mean, it's fine. It's like vanilla, whatever. He doesn't gain any bonuses, um, but he's one of those sieves that's it's kind of similar to Mansa Musa, but a little bit better where if you don't get attacked in the early game if you're just left alone you're allowed to sit there sprawl build cities sim then his late game is just like like no one can stop him right he turns into this powerhouse but that early game he's got that he's got a lot of weaknesses there in the early game and he doesn't really start to excel until industrial era and later um so because of that he actually drops down a full two tiers here um he is still high on the b tier so there is like a chance of him jumping up there but i think freddy just is not as good as i thought he, i mean he's still very good but i think he's not as good as i thought he was before so um frederick sorry bud but you're in b tier and then moving into that we got the next b tier which is shaka of the zulu um he's in b tier here and he's a high b tier because yeah his depend or his versatility is not that high like he really only does one thing and that's domination but holy hell is he really good at it um if you can like like the, the all of his abilities are just bonkers if you capture a, a unit um that doesn't have uh or if you capture a city the the unit that captures that city will turn into a core or an army depending on what you have unlocked also the fact that you get cores with mercenaries instead of uh, um, nationalism and you get armies with nationalism instead of mobilization that is just poof. you are oh my gosh you're going to be going to war and you're going to be taking over every single city as you can you also get a half cost encampment with the Akanda, which gives you 25% faster training of cores and armies which you get those sooner like everything that you want in domination you get like basically a whole era sooner um, including the MP the MP is in a weird location it's still up in military tactics and i dislike that's why i don't like anti-cav units because of their weird placement on the tech tree 
but the MPs are also just one of the best units in the game as well. So you take all of those things into consideration. Yeah, he only really does domination, which is why he's only in B tier, but because of how well he does domination and how strong he is, um, you know, he doesn't require strategic resources. He doesn't require, uh, like he only, you just have to get science basically. So you go like science domination, you just completely destroy the map. So uh, I think the Sulu just really strong, really strong domination, even though that's the only thing that they do. And as we're about to leave uh, B tier here, we only have a couple sieves left. Um, and that sieve is uh, another one that I got a lot of flack for, and I'm still going to get a lot of flack for. And that is uh, that is Hammurabi, Hammurabi of Babylon. Um, he's just one of those sieves. He's the same type of thing where, where he is so dependent on getting Eurekas that if you don't get Eurekas, if you don't have a map where you can get your Eurekas, which is, if you don't know what he does, you get really, cra I think, uh, let, me, let me pull up his stats here. Um, you get, I don't think it's negative science. It's, yeah, minus 50% science per turn. So if you take all of your science yields and cut it in half, that's what you get, which means your science goes really slow. But the thing is, is that if you get a Eureka, you gain that full tech tree, not even, not just the boost. Um, so if you ha happen to spawn on a map where you, you don't gain your Eurekas really early on, you just kind of crawl. Um, now, obviously, you're going to gain some, but I another the video that I alluded to earlier, I was testing with uh, Hammurabi as well, and I think it was four out of the ten maps um, I did not get a lot of boosts on, and that just slows you down so much. Now, on the flip side, everything else about Hammurabi is amazing. <laughs> Uh, he has a really strong early game. Uh, his unique unit is incredibly strong. The the Sabum Kibitum. It's a really good like it's basically an upgraded scout that or it's like a warrior that is uh, a scout. Um, your uh, Palgum is just absolute. It's oh man, God sent like you need you settle on rivers. You get plus two production, plus one housing, and then plus one food to every single tile that's adjacent to fresh water. Like absolutely crazy, crazy. It replaces the water mill. You get it in irrigation, absolutely crazy uh, infrastructure building. Um, and then also his unique ability where whenever you build a specialty district for the first time, you get that builder, you get the lowest production cost building for that district. So if you go religion, this is a, this is a strat that I, I, I taught or well, I talked about before and Potato McWhiskey did it recently. Um, I don't know if he did the religion side of it, but I have a video coming out where I'm doing this, where I did the biosphere tourism and. Um, and you go religious tourism with him and you build holy site, which means you get your shrine immediately, which you can get a religion. And then you go work ethic off of that. You get, you can go bonkers with tourism and stuff like that. So you do get these bonuses with Hammurabi, but because of how dependent he is on the map, if you don't get your Eurekas, it slows him down so much that it, uh, it does not make him S tier. So Hammurabi is still in B tier for me, even considering everything else. And now, the most biased pick of all time that I have, it's still B tier. We've got Teddy. He's still in B tier here. Um, I think he was an A tier in the last Civ, but I'm dropping him down to B tier because of how dependent he is for his abilities to work. Now, obviously, Bull Moose Teddy, you want to do culture with him, right? Like, that's the whole point is you want to do culture. You want to gain a lot of yields. And with his unique ability of gaining uh, science and culture from... Uh, breathtaking tiles if you spawn on a map that gives you a lot of that has a couple breathtaking tiles you start to snowball so fast insanely or er, insanely early there there's been so many times where i've started with like two breathtaking deer tiles next to me and so now you have a two food three production deer tile on a hill that is breathtaking that's giving you that's maybe like next to a mountain and there are trees next to it so you have it's a two three tile that gives you two science and two culture and so you have one of those and that just basically doubles your culture and science output from turn one. Like it's, it's kind of crazy. If you get that start, he is insane. Now, obviously there are multiple times where you start on tiles that don't have any breathtaking tiles. Um, and that drops him down quite a bit to, to B tier. Everything else, his early game strength is really strong because of that. His late game strength, he can, if you can synergize really well with all of your abilities, he can be crazy good. Um, you can do anything you want with Teddy in the game. He doesn't give you any extra bonuses to do that, but because of the early science and early culture that you can get, it allows you to do basically whatever you want. Um, he does gear towards tourism, uh, which is why um, his versatility is down maybe a little bit here instead of like being, you know, S tier. Uh, but because of how dependent he is on everything else, it, it drops him down. Um, 
even as well as he synergizes. So Teddy, B tier. He's obviously way better than Rough Rider, but that, that's where I have him is in, in here. Now, moving on past Teddy, there's only three sieves less, left in B tier. Um, and to, to jump right into to go into that, we have uh, the first of the Greek sieves. Um, we have Gorgo. Now, uh, where is she? She is right here. Here we go. Gorgo is in B tier. Uh, we're going to have to put her like right here, I guess. I need to, to make these a little bit, move these over a little bit more here. Gorgo used to be not i i think I, I i don't remember what i rated her before but um gorgo with the last patch with the buff that she gets is a, is a really good it's a really good sieve um her uh her unique spearman uh is really strong and plus the fact that you get extra combat strength from the every military policy card in the government and considering you also get um a additional wild card policy card policy slot you can run multiple Govern multiple military cards, which means you just get a lot of extra combat strength. It's just it's just so nice. And then whenever you kill a unit, you get extra culture. On top of that, you have the um, you have the Acropolis, which is a half cost theater square. It's she's just a really strong sieve. Obvi I don't think she's as good, obviously, as uh, Pericles, but she's still really strong. She deserves to be up here in B tier. Uh, so that's that's where we have her is is over here in B tier. So um, Gorgo. Hang out right here, because that's where you belong. On top of that, I'm going to go straight into the next one, which is this boy right here, Pachacuti of the Inca. Uh, Pachacuti is, I, I think, is one of those other sleeper sieves that I talk about, maybe with um, kind of like uh, Poundmaker is. Uh, with with the last update that he got, he got a little bit of a buff. Um, and the fact that you can work mountain tiles is, is, is crazy good. Uh, alongside with uh, terrace terrace farms terrace farms are i think my top five tile improvement in the entire game terrace farms being unlocked or getting terrace farms immediately being able to build them with with uh like you don't have to get any tech research with it and the fact they give you plus one whole housing and you get plus one food and extra food for every adjacent mountain um you also get plus one production if it's adjacent to freshwater so if you start on a spawn with with rivers and mountains nearby um if you watch my uh national park tourism preserve game with the inca you'll recognize how strong terrace farms can be so uh the inca they can kind of do whatever you want to do with them their unique uh scout is or, or it's a skirmisher is, is okay it's fine it's not like anything crazy um but the fact that you gain all of these yields allows your cities to be huge um, and allows you to kind of just do whatever you want. If you want to do religion, you can do religion. You can do domination, science, whatever it is. Uh, Pachacuti will allow you to do that. So Incan Empire, B tier, high B tier, uh, almost A tier. So that's that's where he's at. Uh, and I just realized that I skipped another Civ. <laughs> but this is also a B tier Civ. Um, where is he? Uh, Menelik the second of Ethiopia. He is also up here in B tier. Um, Menelik is another one of those civs where they uh, they have everything going for them. Um, they're obviously a faith based tourism civ. You can do science with them if you want. Um, you can kind of do anything with them uh, because of their their abilities, giving you faith output, culture output, science output. If you settle on hills, which is what you need to do, you, all of your cities um, kind of do a mini Pingala thing where you gain fifteen percent extra science and culture. But you do it with their faith output, so you just want to get, you just want to gain as much faith as you can with him, um, which you can pretty easily. Um, he obviously was made to be played with void singers of of the secret societies of void singers, uh, but if you don't play with that, um, that's completely fine. You still gain extra faith regardless. Um, you can also purchase archaeologists and archaeological museums with faith, which helps the tourism output. And then his unique tile improvement is the Rock Hewn Church. And I, I think this is my top three improvement in the entire game. Um, plus one faith, plus one faith for every adjacent mountain tile. It provides tourism from your faith after flight, which is like if you run Earth Goddess on top of it, because it also provides plus one appeal, is just like so much faith, which increases your tourism. They can't be built adjacent to each other, but that's really not that big of a deal um, when you're playing with him. So... Uh, and they have to be built on hills too as well. So incredible sieve, uh, incredible tile improvements, um, really fun to play. So Menelik of Ethiopia in B tier. So leaving B tier, we're running into A tier here and there's only a couple sieves left uh, that we have to go through. Um, so bottom of the A tier poll is Dido. We have Phoenicia. Um, I think Phoenicia is one of those sieves that people really don't think about. Um, 
I think that she's just like people th think of her and she's like, oh, she's just a naval coastal civ. Like you don't, you don't really care about it. And yeah, yeah, sure. You have the Kothon, which is you know a um, half cost harbor, and it does require you to be on uh, the coast. But I think everything else on top of the Kothon is just <laughs> like absolutely crazy. You get fifty percent production towards uh, towards districts in the city with your government plaza. The Kothon gives you plus fifty percent production towards settlers. So if you spawn on a coast. You get, you can rush harbors and then you run, you get a government plaza out, you go ancestral hall and you have, uh, and you have a city that you can like chop out of, or if you just do it in other cities, if you chop out a harbor and then you chop out, that gives you plus 50% production towards settlers. You're building settlers in like five to six turns. And then you chop those out with like maybe two chops from a builder running ancestral hall on top of that allows you to just, just mass expand. You get to expand so freaking fast that it doesn't matter. Everything else doesn't matter because you can get. 10 12 cities out before turn 100 insanely fast just from production alone um you obviously want to cut subtle coastal cities for the kothon so you can get that bonus so if you don't get that then that's okay um you also start with the eureka for writing which is pretty cool allows you to get your campuses out pretty faster but outside of that i mean kothons kothons are the way to go byreams are really strong i will say byreams are very strong but the Kothon and Settler spam is what sets Dido apart. So the first contender for A tier up there, I, I think Dido is a really strong sieve. And then you're going to notice a theme here with uh, with all these A tier sieves. Uh, this this guy is jumping up a bit. Uh, Trajan of Rome, he's also an A tier here. I think I had him in B tier last time, maybe even C tier. Um, that was wrong. <laughs> Trajan is just like, I don't know, he's a really good civ, man. Every single city starts with a free building in the city center. So if it's in the ancient era, you get the monument. So every single city, you get extra culture in the beginning of the game. Um, and then every single founded city starts with a trading post, or if it's uh, within range of the capital, a road to it. So now you have a trading post and a road to it, which means you gain extra gold through Roman trading posts as they pass through, which means you also get movement through all this. It's just, it's so good, man. Then you have the Legion, which replaces the Swordsman, um, that require, you know, only requires 10 iron to train. Uh, what a, like, such, these are, everything about Rome is just good. Um, they also have the Bath, which is, uh, unique um aqueduct only cost 18 production which is like three turns in most cities uh it also um you know everything else about it is just basically normal about the the aqueduct so trajan I, he's just one of those civs every time i people ask me you know i'm new to civ who should i play just play rome play trajan he's a great civ really good at what he does um really just just solid civ uh and that was he should have been higher in my last tier list so there you go uh, next up, which I think I also had, this is another mistake that I had last time too, is uh, is uh, John John Curtin here. We've got uh, Australia who should have, like, he should have been A tier. That was, yeah, <laughs> that's a full, I will I will admit fault of that. John Curtin should have been A tier. What a, what a crazy civ. Um, he is so good. The uh, His unique unit, like everything about him, his unique unit is really good. It's an infantry replacement that doesn't require resources. Infantry requires oil, which is really hard to get in Deity. Uh, well, just in general. So you have a unique unit that's in infantry. That's really good. Requires no resources. The Outback Station is... Uh, you get it with guilds, so it's a little... It's kind of a little later on, but it gives you uh, plus one production and food. Uh, half housing. And then if you have pastures around, which you should because of a start bias, you're going to be gaining like two food, three production, three food, four production, like tiles... Uh, and then you get plus one food from every adjacent outback station once you get rapid deployment. So it's just like one of those tile improvements that's just crazy good. And then plus the fact that you get plus three housing on coastal cities, which means you basically settle on fresh water with coastal cities. And then anytime you build a pasture, it triggers a culture bomb. So you settle, you get animal husbandry, you find horses, you build the horse, the pasture on the horses, and then you just culture bomb that tile. It's just like, it's so good. And then if you're lucky enough to have breathtaking tiles or charming tiles which you gain the extra yields from or adjacency from bonuses from them which you probably will because settling on a coast will allow that it's very very easy if you look at my civ give game when i was playing australia in the civ give i went science and i every single campus i had was above plus four adjacency bonus i had some that were plus eight because it was next to a reef like on a charming tile or sorry breathtaking tile it is crazy john Curtin. Very strong. Australia should have been way up there. I don't. I, that's another one that I admit fully admit fault on because that was just so dumb of me. Australia is very good. Uh, and then quickly moving on here uh, to another really just a really strong civ is we have Vietnam. 
Um, they, when they were released, I knew they were going to be really strong. And after playing them, they're, they sure they have dependencies, right? Like your districts can only be built on specific features. Um, but just knocking that out of the way, like that's really not that big of an issue. Um, it's, it's pretty, since you can build wood so fast with them, uh, one of her unique abilities is that you are able to build, uh, instead of having to wait all the way until, uh, whatever the civic is to, to get naturalists and building woods on. Um, you can build them in, oh, con conservation. You can build them in medieval fairs, which is super, like, that's so soon. Um, I have played them multiple times. I have a uh, a game coming out where I was doing a, a national park tourism only with them, and they're one of the best civs to do that with. So uh, everything about them is really good. Um, their unique unit is very good. Uh, the extra combat strength and movement that they get um, is really good. Uh, Voichien, the Thon, which is an incredible district. It replaces the encampment, which you might think is a little weird. But the fact that they don't take up a specialist district slot, which means they, you know, act as like a spaceport or an aqueduct or something like that. If you're not doing tile improvement stuff, you're not doing national park stuff, you can basically use them as like a free government plaza. And there's been a lot of games where I've played with them where I will have my government plaza, then I'll have my, you know, uh, whatever you know if i have like four cities around my government plaza i'll place my districts around them and then i'll place my thons around them to be surrounded by so now i have thons that are gaining like plus eight culture each it's just i don't know really good civ if you haven't played vietnam if you don't own vietnam i'd highly recommend you know getting the pack that has them and playing them because they're just a really fun civ and a really strong one at that um and then bouncing off of this this is one that people got mad at me Matt, for too <laughs> But uh, I'll explain a little bit here. Um, they're they're an A tier. They're still a very good Civ, but that's Korea. They are not S tier. They are no longer, and I don't think they ever were, the best science Civ in the game. Um, and there's a couple reasons behind that. Now, they, don't get me wrong. They are incredibly strong. Every city that has a governor receives plus three culture and science for each promotion that the governor has. So that obviously scale as time goes on. Um, uh, additionally, they have a special, a half cost campus, which is the Soon. Um, so it's only 27 production on standard speed. The problem, and this is the, the main reason why I don't call them the best science civ in the game, is that um, they so ones can only be built on hills and they gain negative adjacency bonuses when they're built next to other districts aside from government plazas. So um, they gain a, well, I mean, yeah, they still, yeah, from government plazas, any any district as well. So, but it cancels it out because the government plaza gives them plus one anyways. So you want to build so ones on hills by themselves next to mines. Now you can gain plus one science from each adjacent, like your farms and your mines can gain some extra science and stuff like that around the so ons, but you're gonna have such limited space around them anyways that it's not gonna matter that much. And this is important because the, the civs that can do science better than her can get campuses with higher adjacency bonuses, which, you want, which is what you wanna use rationalism for, or they can do everything else better that funds their science, that uh, it makes Korea's abilities not as good because of that. So don't get me wrong, they are still a very good civ. Like the Huaches are good, really good for defense. They are still good at doing science, but because they have how limited they are in their adjacencies, how you can only build them on hills and their dependencies, that keeps them right in the middle of pack of, of A tier. Not S tier, just A tier. And here is another civ that I also recommend everybody to play if they are just learning civ as well. Uh, and that is Hojo. Uh, of Japan. Um, Japan is a really fun civ. They are really good at teaching you how to district. Um, you get the extra adjacency bonuses from building districts next to each other and you can kind of look at that and see, oh, like, you know, if I'm if I'm stacking, you know, districts next to each other, if I learn how to district, I get really good bonuses. Even if they are exaggerated because you are playing Japan because you get a, a major adjacency bonus, it still kind of teaches you how to do that. Um, Samurais are really good. An incredible unit. Only requires 10 iron to train. Uh, replaces the man-at-arms. Really strong unit. Um, and then also the, the Divine Wind. You know, the extra combat strength for fighting on coastal or shadow tiles are really nice. Um, and you also, uh, you don't get the, um, uh, you also get uh, encampments, holy sites, and theater squares half built on uh, in that time too. So, really good civ really strong civ not they are not weak at anything that they do they are just really good and really strong in everything so japan up there uh high a tier now this is uh i, I mean it's not counterintuitive but it's uh, another really high class a tier civ um and that is uh that is simon bolivar and the reason why i'm throwing simon bolivar up here in a tier it's because he's similar to what shaka does is that he is so good at domination 
that hit just puts him in his own tier above every other domination sieve um the main reason is because of his movement speed now he gets plus one movement speed for all units and the fact that you promote if you have a promotion on a unit it doesn't end that unit's turn so there has been so many times when i'm playing simon bolivar where i have a siege unit i'm able to move the siege unit promote it and then still shoot in the same turn whereas like you'd only be able to move and then sometimes you don't even get to move and promote because maybe you have to move on top of a hill or a forest or something like that if on top of that he gets a uh, a unique general the commandante uh, which is a unique great person after every single era, which also gives them plus one movement and plus five combat strength. So you have a free general that gives you movement. So now you have like plus four, plus six, you know, around their movement points on all of your units. Um, and you get extra combat strength. So you can just freaking Zerg rush everybody. It's so, he's so fast. He's so fast and it's just so crazy. There have been so many times where I've just been able to take cities super fast because my siege units can move and shoot on the same turn without getting that promotion. Um, Gennaro's really strong unit. Um, I, they, they come out pretty late. They do take military science, like they replace calves, but for how strong they are, I think that's fine. Uh, and uh, Haciendas, I think Haciendas are really, really good. I just think that they come too late in mercantilism. Um, they, they are comparable to Outback Stations, um, except I think their bonuses are a little bit better when they're stacked next to each other, but that, that that's fine. Simon Bolivar does everything that you want to do for domination. And he does it well, and you don't have to worry about getting a, a unique unit in order to do it. So uh, up there in A tier. All right, we have two left, two left in A tier. Before we get to S tier, um, and who is it? There's only four sieves left here. We've got Ambiorix, Pericles, the Kamai, and Peter. Uh, and if you guessed, uh, if you guessed Pericles correct, um, if you guessed Pericles, uh, uh, you are wrong because it's Ambiorix. <laughs> Ambiorix is up there in A tier. He's almost S tier. The Gaul are very close to being S tier. Uh, he's just really good man when he was when he was announced and they announced his features i was like this guy is gonna be just like broken in multiplayer he's just so good you receive culture equal to 20 percent of the production cost of, of training a, a military unit you also gain extra combat strength for units that are around them so if you use their gesite which is their unique unit they they can you, i'm sure you've seen the memes where you see gesite fighting tanks right because they gain extra combat strength for units around them on top of the plus 10 combat strength when fighting units with a higher uh a higher combat base strength plus a great general on top of it plus fighting against a dish like you can get really strong gesites without you know it just replaces a warrior um additionally they get they, they get an oppidum which is a half cost uh, industrial zone that that uh has walls um and so you can do some really crazy builds with them you can do some really crazy tourism builds some really crazy space builds uh, Ambiorix is just one of, one of the best civs in the game, and so I have him up in high A tier, almost S tier, but but not just quite. And then, you know, I didn't really trick you because the next and the last A tier civ is Pericles. Uh, Pericles is just a... Uh, he is a crazy... He's such a good civ. Uh, Pericles of Greece. Um, you, you, he's one of those civs where you can nearly almost do anything with... Uh, with him, I mean, you have the you have the half cost theater square, um, which is just a I mean anything any half cost district is just a, a, like an instant plus for for a sieve, um, but the fact that uh, you know it gives you an envoy when you complete, and then you have his unique bonus of getting culture for every single city state that you have your suzerain over. You just basically you suze every single city state, you gain an insane amount of culture, and this is something that I feel like isn't talked about a lot, um, and I I think it, it's a belief that I have for sieve is that culture is king. Uh, with the more culture you have, the better you do with science victories, the better you do with domination, the better you do with religion. Uh, but culture is king, and, and the fact that he can gain so much culture so fast is just, uh, it's just really, really good. Um, you, also, you obviously have the Hoplite. Hoplite's a good unit. Uh, and then you gain an additional wildcard policy slot, so you have a, an additional wildcard slot in the beginning. It's just, you know, it's a very, very good sieve. So, um, Pericles nearly S tier. I think he's literally one or two points off for being S tier. So uh, yeah, that's where we have him. And here we're jumping into the last two sieves in the game. We have J of the Kamai and we have Peter here of Russia. This was pretty hard to, to, to figure out which one of these two is the best. Um, and so 
uh, I'm going to do them both right now. So the first one, the second, is Peter. Peter is not the best Civ in the game anymore. He's close. He's still S tier. But he's not the best Civ in the game anymore. That's obviously the Kamai. That's that's a big shock. That's a big jump from me considering the Kamai being one of the worst Civs in the game to the best. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm sure you guys have heard me rant about Peter so much. I've talked about Peter ad nauseum of how good he is. And the main reason, and there's two main reasons why. Lavras and Monumentality. Lavra is his unique uh, holy site. A half cost holy site that you can get by turn 15 sometimes. So you, you can get your holy site out by turn 15. You get the extra great profit points. You're basically guaranteed a religion with him every single time in the game because you get your holy site so fast. Additionally, he spawns in Tundra almost all the time, even when you're running vanilla um, and uh, not running like BBS or anything like that. So you get Dance of the Aurora. And since work ethic was added to the game, you get a work ethic with your religion almost every single time. So now you have like, with Dance of the Aurora, you'll have a plus 10, plus 11 holy site that is running a plus 10 production because you have work ethic on top of it. And that just allows you to do anything you want. Um, you, you, you'll get like two to three cities around the classical era. You'll, and then you get the classical era golden age because you get un unique lavra because you get a, um, you can get your pantheon fast because you can get your religion fast. You're almost guaranteed a golden age with Peter. Um, and that allows you to get monumentality. Now, if you don't know what monumentality is, you don't play with rise and fall. You only play with vanilla. It is something that was added in rise and fall. And that is a bonus that allows you in that era to buy civilian units with faith. So that includes settlers, that includes traders, and that includes builders. The settlers is the big uh, aspect of that. If monumentality did not exist, Peter would not be number one. Um, but because it does exist, because of how much faith you can get the early game, because you can almost guarantee a golden age in the classical era, you can get 10 cities like very reliably by turn like 70. It's kind of disgusting how good he is. Um, and on top of that, that allows you to do whatever you want. I've done, you know, Peter sub 200 Peter space games, sub 200 culture games, like sub 130. I think it was like 116, right? Was my religion game. Like he is so disgustingly good. The only, the only thing that drops him below the Kamai is his adjacent or his dependencies on being in Tundra. Um, even if you don't have Tundra, he's still insanely good because you have a half cost holy site. You have a half cost first district that uh, that guarantees you basically a religion because of the extra great profit points. So um, that is where Peter is at. He is in S tier. And then on top of that, we have J. Oh, the Kamai. How you have, like, look how far you've risen. This this is insane. I, I think I had him in D tier in the last, in the last, um, uh, in the last tier list. But J is far and above the best civilization in the game with all of the buffs that he got in uh in the last patch they took away his relic mini game that you used to have with him but they gave him so much good stuff oh my gosh we can talk about this forever so jay whenever you build a holy site it grants food equal to their adjacency bonus you receive plus two adjacency bonuses from the river and you also get housing next to the river which um engages and triggers a culture bomb so with jay you don't even care about running like earth goddess or anything like that you want to get the pantheon where you get the extra amenities from rivers. <laughs> so a river goddess. So you go river goddess, you build holy sites next to the river. So you're, if you build a holy site on a river next to your city center, you're gonna have a, immediately a plus three holy site. Um, on top of that, uh, he has a, a ability with cities that give extra amenities from uh, aqueducts and you get plus one faith for every single population. Um, your farms also gain food next to a, uh, an aqueduct and they also gain plus one faith next to a holy site. On top of that, you have the Prasat, which replaces the temple. The Prasat gives you a relic slot. It gives you six faith. It gives you a citizen uh, citizen slot. It also gives you extra great profit points per turn, which increases the amount of faith that you're going to be getting. Um, it also provides tourism, and it gives you half a culture point per population in that city. What an insane building, like top tier building as well. Um, Dom rays are also really good too, but we're leaving the Dom ray out of this because... The implication for all of this stuff, you, you might be thinking like, okay, cool, you get like 
really, you know, your cities can grow really big and, and you have a lot of faith. Like, what does that matter? That matters because you get your, your cities get to grow faster than they do for Peter, which means that your cities can build districts faster, which means you get more production, which means everything just starts to snowball really, really, really heavily with him. Um, his early game is super strong because you get your holy site because it, it, you rely on a holy site, which is the first district that you get. You don't have to, you know, wait until to get an IZ. You don't have to wait to get a harbor or something along those lines. The amount of faith and the amount of food that you can gain in your cities, which also uh, in turn gives you, a, you also gain a lot of amenities too, just based off of his kit alone, means your cities are going to be happy, sometimes ecstatic in the early game, which allows you to get the extra food bonus, the extra production bonus. You just gain every, like every single thing that you want in Civ, you gain from playing J, from playing the Kamai. Um, easily the best Civ in the game. If you don't believe me, go play him right now. Go play a culture game with him. Go play a religious science game with him. Go play a domination game with him and, and come back and tell me how wrong I am uh, because he's easily the best Civ in the game. It's it's kind of crazy how good they made him. Um, if you haven't watched Potato McWhiskey's video on why he loves the Kamai, this was before the patch too. He made some very valid arguments that I think I will agree with looking back on it now of why they were really good then. And then now on top of that, Adding every single bonus that they have on top of that is just like, he's so good. He is, he's disgustingly good. It's easily, like I said, the best Civ in the game. And he's also really fun to play too. So there you have it. That's, uh, that. those are my top two S tier Civs. Well, with that being said, we've done it. <laughs> we finished it. We're at the, we're at the end here. Um, we, we did load B a little bit here, but I think if I space things out a little bit, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't look as heavy, top heavy as it does. Obviously there's some civs that could maybe go down and go up, like maybe Teddy can go down, um, etc. But I'm pretty happy with how I've rated this. If you wanted to compare this, my, my, um, or in look at it and make your own tier list of your own, the spreadsheet is in the description down below. So you can open up the spreadsheet, make a copy of it, edit it yourself, maybe edit some of the weighting yourself. Um, you know, uh, go off of that. Uh, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty content with this. I think this is a pretty, pretty solid list that I have so far. I, I'm really content with the A tier. I'm really content with S tier. Uh, even though people heavily disagree with me on Gilgamesh, I still think Gilgamesh is by far the worst Civ in the game. So, um, let me know what you guys think about it. Uh, this is, I think my final tier list for leaders. I don't think I'm going to do another one. Um, you know, B and C, C you can swap those depending on how I feel throughout the day but i think everything else is is uh pretty solid um if you guys are new to this channel uh please subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content i put out content regularly of civilization 6 in the future there's going to be more 4x stuff uh, additionally you can also watch me play civilization 6 on twitch.tv slash bostheus where i stream every monday through friday at 12 p.m pacific time except for fridays i stream at 2 uh, and then, you know, if, tell me how much you hate or love this uh, tier list. Tell me what you agree with. Tell me what you disagree with in the comments down below. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for watching. I know this is lengthy. Uh, there are timestamps through all, all of this. So hopefully you skipped around in those and use those to your advantage. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I hope I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.